All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad you all arrived safe travels. Um, I'd like to go ahead and call the January 2023 Committee on Accreditation Meeting to order. Will the staff please call the roll? Jomaline Balatayo. Here. Augustine Cervantes. Here. Here. Okay, one more time. Jomaline Balatayo. Here. 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 Kathy Kresha. I can't Here. Oh, there you go. Katrina Chikowski. Cheryl Forbes. Bob Fraley. Here. Alan Hallis. Here. Mike Hillis. Marty Martinez. Here. Jason Lee. Gerard Morrison. Here. Kevin Taylor. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Um, at our last meeting, we had a new member join us by Zoom, Augustine Cervantes, and we'd like to welcome him. Thank you very much for being here in person. Anything you want to say? If, was every, I'm not sure if everybody was here last time, but would you like this brief introduction to yourself? Sure thing, uh, Agustin Cervantes. I am a uh, director of student services for our College of Education uh, at Cal State LA. Uh, looking forward to working with everyone uh, now in person. Great, thank you for being here. Welcome. And we also want to welcome Commissioner Davis, who was with us last time. Thank you for joining us again. So this is a web meeting and we have some technology where just starting off, we are all in the commission office and we are on Zoom. So you're gonna see us that way. Uh, we might have some technical issues along the way, so we just got to ask that everybody bear with us. So it's being conducted in hybrid fashion. All members and most staff are participating here in the office. Many participants of this meeting and some staff will be attending virtually. The Zoom link has been made available to the public. Regarding microphones, please mute your laptop speakers and microphones and mute yourselves on the Zoom video. It's very important a reminder to please press the button on the microphone to activate it when you speak. If you do not do that, those listening online will not be able to hear your comments and they will not be recorded. It is also important to turn off your microphone when you are finished speaking. For those participating via Zoom, we'd like to ask that everyone check their Zoom ID and be sure it contains your first and last name accurately so we're able to call on you appropriately and also so that we can get all the names accurately recorded in the record. If you need to update your name, click on the three dots in the window with your picture to bring up the rename option. When it's time to take up an item, we'll need a moment to bring the appropriate attendees into the main meeting room and make sure that they can see and hear the committee and that we can see and hear them as well. Participants will need to turn on their camera and unmute their microphone. Regarding public comment, if any member of the public wishes to comment on a specific item, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen during the item. You'll be brought into the main meeting room at the appropriate time and asked to state your name and affiliation for the record. If you wish to speak on a specific item, please send a request through the chat feature telling us which item you wish to speak to so we can make sure to call on you during the appropriate time. Or you can send your comments through the chat feature and we'll read those aloud. Please make sure we have your full name and affiliation and which item and name you're referencing. There's also a time designated for general public comment at the end of the meeting. The meeting is being recorded. Once the meeting has ended, the archived audio and video will be available via the Commission's website. For committee members, when you make your motions, please state the motion in full so there is no question what the motion is. All votes will be conducted via roll call. Just before the vote, we'll remind everyone to make sure you are unmuted so that we do not miss anyone's vote. If you are unable to respond via video or audio, you may make your vote known through the chat function. The secretary will have to read your name and your vote when she gets to that part of the roll call vote to be sure it's an official part of the record and to make sure the public knows what the vote is. Because this can be quite cumbersome, we'd like to leave this as a last option. Any committee member have any questions about the protocols or voting process for today? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item two. Item two is the approval of the agenda. 
Do I have a motion to approve the, I, the agenda for the January 2023 meeting? Please remember to unmute your microphone when speaking. Motion by Member Tchaikovsky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Member Taylor. Will the Secretary, please call the roll. Joe Malin Balatayo. Aye. My exercise. Um, Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Charles Forbes. Aye. Paul Crayley. Aye. Helen Hellis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right. Wish it carries. Thank you. Moving on to item three. Item three is the approval of the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 22 meeting? And as a reminder, it'd be appropriate for any committee member not in attendance at that meeting to abstain. Member Forbes. I move we accept the minutes of the prior meeting. Thank you. So moved. Is there a second? Second, Member Hillis. Any further discussion? All right. Will the secretary please call the roll? Joe Malin Balatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Abstain. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Charles Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hellis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Ger Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right, motion carries. Item four is the co-chair and members report. Um, just from the co-chair perspective, uh, co-chair Martinez and I, we presented at the commission meeting in December, right? And, and so we basically spoke on, on behalf of the committee of the work that we've done over the past year. And we are is very well prepared for us by Cheryl and Aaron and other staff members. So thank you for setting us up so well. Uh, but we are here, we spoke to about what the work, good work that we're doing, kind of filled everyone in, asked, answered a few questions. And I know Commissioner Davis was at that meeting too. So I don't know if Commissioner Davis or Cheryl or Aaron, if you wish to offer any comments or Marty on your perspective on things. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, Bob really framed it well, but um, you know, what was most impressive, I think, is just what the amount of work that's been done across the accreditation system and that's come through our committee. Um, you know, um, and, and um, I think in light of, of, of coming out of the pandemic and then really just all the changes that we've been kind of monitoring and facilitating um, was impressive. And so I just want to say, you know, pat ourselves on the back, good work. And, and really to say the same thing for the accreditation system, all the volunteers that make it work for us. Yep. Amen. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davis. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry for my tardiness. And I want to say that at the commission meeting last time, um, I gave a report about what um, transpired here at the committee. And I want to say thank you all for your professionalism and thank you for getting the work done. This is um, just a, a great group of folks here and um, you're doing um, the great work that I I have, I, like I said last time, I geek out when it comes to accreditation. Don't, don't, don't look at me crazy. Um, that I've always wanted to do, and I want to say I get to see Cheryl and I get to see Marty one more time um, during, um, you know, the year. So that makes it all a plus. Thank you very much. Thank you, and and Commissioner Davis, your report was very thorough, and it seemed very well received by the rest of the members. <laughs> Thanks. Thank um, any members have anything you wish to report? All right, seeing nothing, we'll move on to item five. Item five is staff reports. Ms. Sicky, will you please begin? Yeah, I think I'll turn it over to Erin to start. I know she wants to introduce a new staff member. Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for bearing with us and working with us over the last few weeks as we continue to try to integrate anybody or everybody into our, um, into our state booking system for lodging and hotels. Um, with that in mind, I would like to um, just take this opportunity to introduce you to one of the newest members of our staff. Gloria Byrne is the lead on our travel team now. Gloria has been here since December 1st. Prior to that, um, uh, you may remember Jamal Harbison. He left us in June 
um, which wasn't um, a, a tremendous problem until uh, <laughs> fall rolled around and we all started traveling a lot again. A lot of conferences, a lot of new staff hired that we were trying to get to the conferences. So um, I did my best, but uh, it's suffice to say there was a bit of a backlog when Gloria joined in December. And she has really, she and the rest of the travel team, Terry McGuire, if you're watching, Eric Schmidt, um, they really have got a, a, a really nice system, a great rhythm going now and um, are just pushing things through. So um, thank you. Thank you again for bearing with us and for being patient. Um, with regard to work, I'm really, really excited to um, report that um, for the first time since I have been in charge of uh, program review, we again found a really nice rhythm this year um, with the addition of Sarah Solari. Um, we have a, a really nice team. Cheyenne uh, Jones is on the team with us, Hart Boyd, Roxanne Purdue, and Sarah. We really were able to divide and conquer the like 11 to 14 ish program review sessions. Um, it gave staff more space to be able to immediately review the feedback. Um, and so we are on track to send the feedback back to institutions in the next week or two, which is really, really great. Um, I think that's the earliest we've been able to do it since I've been um, in charge of that program. So we're all feeling really good about that. Of course, common standards review is due soon for the institutions in the blue cohort. And those sessions for review are already set up. Um, I've been holding weekly office hours, uh, one hour a week for institutions that have common standards review due. We've got a lot of the same people coming, new people coming, um, but they're really appreciative of those office hours. So those have been going well. And then um, we have preconditions submissions due for um, red and green cohorts. And those are due, those are due end of March, common standards are due end of February. So we've got all of that rolling out as well as some other things that I know Cheryl's gonna talk about, but um, lots of work moving and things are just going really well. Very happy for that. I just want to jump in I, and, and the work, I mean, we all see what they do, right? And, but we don't see what they do behind the scenes. Uh, so again, just a great shout out and thank you and congratulations for the outstanding work. Very pleased to hear that you feel things are, are locked in. We feel it from our perspective too, that things are really clicking along and Gloria and Jerry, thank you for being part of the team you mentioned somebody else as well. Um, yeah. And we're getting, I'm getting emails from, from you. So thank you so much which <laughs> on top of things. It's like, Say, Aaron, I need this. Like within two minutes, here comes the email. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Sure. And I know uh, Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to say that what you're And before, before relationships, absolutely. It's not just the hours that are put in, but it's building relationships where people want to be able to come back and, and keep promoting that. Thank you. Yeah, Member Forbes. Well, in addition, I'd just like to give a special shout out to all of the program review team um, for the bilingual authorization office hours that Miranda and Yore just hosted with Cobte. That was a really productive session, I thought. And um, we've appreciated the flexibility and, uh, <laughs> and the deadline. Let's just be real, uh, you know, because, the, you know, the, the standards are and the bilingual teaching performance expectations are a change for the field. And I think a really productive one and a rich one, but we appreciate all the support from the commission. Thanks, Cheryl. I wanted to go next to Kara because I know Kara's trying to finish an agenda item also. So, <laughs> so it might be in the can. Oh, is that good? Okay. <laughs> well, let's go to you anyways. You guys all know Kara is the money woman. She is the administrator over the grants programs. And as you know, we have lots of money we're trying to get out the door to all of you and all of the um, prep programs out there. Indeed, we have more money to hand out. So since October, when I gave an update, 
we've been very teacher residency heavy. So um, I'm here to report that uh, we have announced 15 more teacher residency capacity grantees in addition to the 41 who originally announced uh, with, this is our 2021 funds. 2018, or we're wrapping up, that project period will end this June. And we're now talking about the new monies that we um, we have and that are being passed out. So um, that makes about, if I do my math right, I know I'm the grants person, I should be doing math correctly. Um, 56, yeah, 56 grant, thank you. <laughs> so commis- or committee members are on this for that. Yes, 56, um, 56 capacity grantees so far this year. And we have some money left in that. So there'll be around three of uh, RFAs coming out this spring, early spring. When I say spring, it starts in January, right? So February-ish, there'll be a new RFA for that coming out. Um, the next round of expansion grants for teacher residency are coming, it's, are due tomorrow. So we'll have more information on that later. That is round two. Uh, There will be a round three for expansion, but what we have decided is expansion is kind of like implementation and let's not be muddied any longer. We don't care if you're expanding or implementing, it's all the same. So we're going to have one RFA coming out next for both expansion and implementation. Okay. So it's just going to, we think it will streamline the process a little bit more for all our friends in the field and us here at the commission. Um, Let's see. Since October, we have announced 42 teacher residency grantees who are starting out, who are doing the implementation. Um, and that was announced, I believe, in December. Okay. So lots of money going out for teacher residency for capacity expansion and implementation. At our next commission meeting in February, uh, Cheryl just alluded to it, we have what I'm calling the behemoth teacher residency report. And actually, it isn't just teacher residency report, it's residency reports, because as we all well know, we've added, uh, the state has added some money for school counselor residency. And um, I think it was committee member Hillis who asked, when is that RFA going to come out, Kara? Right? <laughs> At our October meeting. And indeed, we're je- we are in the final stages. We're hoping for the third. I don't think we're going to make the third, but definitely in the first two weeks of February, we will release that RFA. And that's for capacity building around school counselor residencies, because that is very new to us and to you all. So we're going to put out the word that tell us what you think this, you know, what might your plans be? How, how do we start even planning around school counselor residencies? Um, and we, at that particular meeting, we will also talk just briefly about the Technical Assistance Center uh, RFA, which is due in March, March 10th, I believe. Um, and that is a support, uh, it's, it's, a, it's funding for to have a support system for all of our residency programs, both counselor residency, teacher residency, um, awarded to um, an LEA county office district, whomever would like to take on that, that work of supporting teacher residency programs. Um, and at the um, commission meeting, West Ed will join us at the table and discuss their findings. Uh, They're doing a, an evaluation of the 2018 grantees, teacher residency grantees, and uh, they work hand in hand with us around collecting data. We collect the data, but we hand it to them and, and they will give some findings about uh, what's going on and what are the strengths and lessons learned and so on around teacher residency. So we're very excited. We still have money to hand out. We will continue to have at least two RFAs a year until the project period is just about over. So um, for 2021 funds, we I think it's until the 20. 2026, I think. And then we have another pot of money that came out this year for teacher residency and school counselor. And I believe that project period um, needs to be encumbered by the uh, 2027. So lots of funding. We're still working. We have an amazing team. I'm just excited. All right. (laughs) Can we tell you? So Classified is another very popular um, uh, grant program. And we will announce grantees tomorrow. No, you don't get any new, any uh, of knowledge, you know, previous knowledge. What's it called? Insider information, none of it, no. Um, But I can say that after the second round of classified that we'll announce tomorrow, we still have about 45 million left. So we'll do another RFA for classified that will come out 
late February, early March ish. We have to kind of get through, you know, passing the money out to this current group. Um, integrated, integrated uh, undergraduate program grants. We have uh, both planning grants and or planning and implementation grants. And uh, there's money for that, about uh, 25 million, I believe. Those RFAs are due February 13th. Um, we've had a robust round of questions that we have answered in an FAQ document, and there'll be another FAQ document coming out probably early next week because the questions keep coming in because friends in the field are thinking about what, what, what should we do? How do you know? And, and this is great. So we're hoping that all of that money is disseminated in this, you know, one round of RFAs. There are two RFAs open, but it's only one round because it is only this year's funding. Okay, there's a project period for folks to work on, but we have to get this money out the door this year. You know, it's unlike the other ones where we have until whenever, you know, 2027 to get money out the door. So it's really imperative that you're thinking about an integrated, now's the time. And those are due February 13th. I think, and then we have computers, you know, we have the other ones, you know, and everything's on our website. So feel free to join us or just email us and we're happy to answer questions. We were, we were a little concerned with the budget deficit, whether or not some of these monies would be swept and they weren't, so not this time. So if you're interested, um, anyone that has a project you're thinking about that fits into the, the, the funding priorities, you know, um, send in those RFPs or send in those grant applications, RFAs. Th thank you, I always get those two mixed up. They're very different in the state world. <laughs> um, yes, so. I uh, just wanted to let you know. Thank you, Kara. Really appreciate it. Does anybody have questions for Kara? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kara. Um, just curious. I mean, I know that you talked about evaluation and there's going to be more formal reporting coming out of that. But as someone who was involved with one of the like earliest residency programs, I'm just curious if you had to identify one characteristic or feature of programs that have successfully expanded or institutionalized residency in an LEA, what would that be? That's a hot fire question. It's all about the partnership, friends. Mm -hmm. It is all about the partnership. If your LEA and your IEG are really coordinating, this is an amazing program, teacher residency. It is the Cadillac. And mm -hmm. um, so to me, the, the grantees who are really have a robust partnership with their IHE are rocking and rolling. And the IHE in collaboration with that LEA are really responding to things like recruitment. You know, you know some institutions, you know, in February, they know who's going to be in their program in fall, Right. And sometimes that's challenging if you're in this partnership and residency funding and the whole works. But there are a lot of institutions, they work, you know, the LEAs and IHEs work together on, for example, recruitment. They, they um, choose the, the residents together, okay? You know, so if, 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 if there's partnership, true partnership, uh, these programs can be very, very strong. Um, the other concept of the cohort model and having, um, your course, coursework out in the LEA is very powerful. Um, having your course, courses uh, curriculum designed with the LEA concept in mind, okay? Uh, you know, depending on the textbooks you use or whatever. I, so it's just, it's that partnership. Partnership is key. Nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That was that was that, that was pretty much an A plus answer. I got like sub sub responses, <laughs> categories. It's almost like you've already like figured this stuff out. Yeah, we see it. You know, we see it when, when things come in, when the data comes in. So a few more a few more things on our list. Um, so I did mention the governor's budget. Um, the governor's budget came out on Jan ten, like it usually does, and. Our budget as an agency was um, stable, basically. Um, it, it, there really were not any major issues. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, so I think for the next year, we're, we're kind of on solid ground. I don't think we have a lot to worry about. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you wanna jump in. 
Um, yeah, I'm the little dark cloud in the room. Yeah, yeah. The governor yeah, introduced this year. I meant this year. The governor introduces his budget, um, but the legislature now has till June to take their own um, to take their own uh, stance on certain things in that budget. So um, while yeah, the governor was very kind to us, um, you know, I always say we can't. We just can't count those chickens till they're hatched. Um, we don't have any reason to believe anything, you know, will happen, but looking forward, hopefully to um, the fee waiver for exams that was in place for this year being, being implemented again. So that'll be, that'll be nice for folks. Um, but a lot of work to do, I think between now and June, especially in a budget deficit year. Um, so I, it was a good budget coming from the governor and then we'll see what happens with the legislature. Um, just a few more things. We've been working really, really hard to get the PK3 credential off the ground. Um, we, we have, a, there's a lot to do. There's a whole reg package that, ha that is being put together and that um, we have, a, we now have a, a regs team here in the agency, which is fantastic. Um, but many of them are new. So they're, you know, kind of learning the re regulatory um, processes as, as they're, you know, flying the plane. So we've been working on that reg package. Um, and also at the same time, in a parallel track, trying to get, to get programs ready to go ahead and, and um, provide uh, pr proposals. So um, there's a lot of documentation. We have had to go through the, the standards and try to figure out, do we need anything uh, above and beyond what we normally ask for IPR, for initial program uh, review? Um, we've been having a series of webinars. Um, we started with an overview of the PK3 credential, and then we uh, last week had one dedicated specifically to the literacy standard for PK3. We have one, two more coming up next, three more coming up next week. Two of them are on two of the newer standards. One is on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and I think it's in a different order on these standards. Equity, inclusion, and diversity, I think, is the order on the standard. And then the math standard. So we have um, dedicated um, uh, webinars for those two standards, as well as one for on February 3rd for initial program review to talk about what kinds of documentation we need from programs that are planning. We're running these on parallel tracks. It's a little tricky from my perspective timing wise because we're trying to get programs up and running if they want to be up and running by next fall. We know you have all sorts of things you have to do at an institution in order for something like that to happen on that kind of scale, you know, between your faculty senates and your um, admissions and all of those kinds of things. So we're working as fast as we can. Um, and as soon as the regs are approved or at least close to approval, then we can give you guys the go ahead. And obviously all of those programs are gonna come to this body. Um, at some point. So we're doing what we can. We'll just keep you apprised as we kind of make progress in this area. It's a little bit of a tap dance as we try to figure out what's moving, what hasn't moved. Um, we did put an item on today's agenda for you to really dig into that credential. Um, uh, Renee Marshall, who is our administrator over early childhood now, she's um, our newest administrator. You met her, I think, two meetings ago. She will, um, she'll be here this afternoon to, to go over that with, um, as well as a couple of other of our consultants and are working closely with that credential. So I just wanted to let you know, we're working really hard on that. We go ahead. Oh, please. I'm going to take this opportunity to put in a little bit of a plug. Um, I asked director, executive director, um, um, Sandy to say this at the last commission meeting, but, you know, for reviewing of these programs, we need some folks with ECE expertise. We don't have that in our pool of BIR reviewers right now because it's new for us. So um, I did send out uh, I sent an ask to um, deans and directors yesterday, asking them to recommend some folks, um, faculty in their own institutions that have ECE expertise. Um, I emailed some people in our BIR, um, asking them um, if they were interested, if they had some ECE expertise. Uh, so I'm just putting out a plug. Um, if you work with anyone, if you yourself has some ECE expertise, and you'd like to be involved at least in these first this first round is going to be so important for us. We're, we're trying to keep the session small, um, keep staff, the staff presence large, and hopefully have it be not just a review session, but also an opportunity for us to learn from the reviewers, what pieces of the evidence really work, what things could we ask differently, how could we make the process go differently. So it's really going to be an interactive process, this first review, but um, we need some, we need some folks with ECE expertise. So um, please let me know. Feel free to give people my email or my phone number. I'm here for that. 
Um, Aaron, I, I just wondered if you had reached out to um, Commissioner Brown, Catherine Brown, to see mm -hmm. which context she has, because she works with early childhood mm -hmm. uh, folks. Yes, of course she does. And I should have known that okay. right off the top of my head. I appreciate <laughs> the reminder. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to mention um, in the ever, the long saga of subject matter, um, we are continuing to work on that reg package. And that is any day now, if it's not already over at OAL, and that means that they would have 30 days to review. Um, so that clock would start ticking soon. We had to do the 45 days, we had to do a 15 day update. Uh, there's lots of time frames on this whole thing. So um, so we are getting close, hopefully, to um, hearing whether OAL is going to approve those regs, but we will, we will know that soon. And of course, we continue to work on that topic. And maybe that's a good segue for um, David, because I know David was asked by the commissioners to, um, to, ha to present a plan at the next commission meeting for re reviewing subject matter requirements. Um, and maybe you can just give us a little update on that quickly, David. Thanks. Good timing, David. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we are putting together a plan and the commission had asked us to look at social sciences first because um, there were concerns raised at the December meeting about the proposed majors of history and ethnic studies. So uh, we will be presenting that plan in um, two weeks at the commission meeting. Uh, we're going to finish up the item right now, so I don't want to say anything that's not going to be in the item. Uh, but basically, it's <clears throat> the commission does not have any uh, authority over the content that's taught in K-12 schools. And our standards need to be based on, our, our subject matter requirements need to be based on the TK-12 student standards. So it's not going to be a... Um, bring a huge group of experts together to do this because we already have the content and we just need to put it in a new format that is easier for programs or more efficient for programs to use when uh, evaluating transcripts but still works for building our exams. That, and that will be a, a large project when we get things off the ground on that one. Um, I wanted to also mention, by, especially bilingual here, bilingual regs are, and you had asked, OAL means Office of Administrative Law. They approve the regulations. So um, the bilingual regs are in their hands at the moment. So we're, we'll, we're waiting and hopefully they'll have just a few questions because sometimes they have lots of questions <laughs> and we have to answer them within that 30 day period. So usually it's within, you know, 48 hours or a week. So, um, so we're looking forward to bilingual being finally kind of official. Um, Let's see. And I just wanted to mention a couple things on your agenda real quick. We don't ha typically have a consent item. Um, and so we wanted to just let you know, we put the consent item at your request. The last time you will recall at the last meeting, there were two items that I erroneously put as information instead of action. And so you couldn't take action on them, even though you discussed them and you had no issues with them. So we put them on consent this time. I just wanted to, to talk through the process. Consent items cannot be discussed. So you, you put forward a motion and you vote on them. A member can pull a consent item off of the calendar if you want. And, and what would happen if you wanted, if you really wanted to discuss one is you would have to make a motion to pull or you'd have to actually pull an item off of the consent calendar. I don't believe you need a motion for that. You vote on what's remaining of the consent calendar and then you talk about what's left and then you vote on that piece. So just that's not a typical thing for us, for this body. So I just wanted to um, go through that and we can go through that again. Um, and I think that's it. I just wanted to mention also, thanks to Aaron, we pulled together a team lead refresher um, uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, and talk about relationships, um, you know, the relationships with our team leads are very, very, very important. Um, these are people who dedicate so much time and energy to the accreditation world and are so thank we're so thankful for their, their expertise, energy, effort, um, diplomacy. <laughs> They're very good at, um, you know, working through thorny issues and that kind of thing. So um, we had a really good meeting with them a few weeks ago and, um, and they're excited to, to continue serving as team lead. So we thank them. So that's it for our report. Thank you all for the detailed report. Appreciate it. Uh, we're moving on to item six. Item six is the consent item that uh, Ms. Hickey was just referring to. 
and is for action. Remember, we discussed the current County Office of Education and Las Virginas Unified School District at our October 22 meeting, and we agreed to add those to the consent calendar at this meeting for action. So staff is recommending that the COA approve the January 23 consent items, including the removal of all stipulations for both institutions. Are there any recusals on the item? One, Member Hillis. Is there a motion to approve the January 2023 consent item? Uh, Member Balatayo? I move that we approve the January 2023 consent item. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Member Hillis. Hall, I'm sorry, so Hollis. You guys should sit next, I know, Don't sit next to each other. It's not allowed anymore. <laughs> Um, so we have, we have a motion was made and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, Secretary, please call the roll. Romaline Bolatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Krasia. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. That motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item seven. Item seven is program approval recommendations. Uh, for program approvals, this is an action item. There are three institutions with three programs for approval. We're going to address each one separately. Uh, are there any recusals? And at this point, you can re recuse yourself from any of these at this point. All right, seeing none. The first program approval is from Fresno Pacific University, Pupil Personnel Services, School counseling intern. We saw no recusals. So, is there a motion to approve the Pupil Personnel Services School Counseling Intern Program for Fresno Pacific University? Motion by Member Tchaikovsky. I move that we approve said program proposal. And I can read it here if I need to. Fresno Pacific University's proposal. Thank you. That's good. And is there a second? A second by Member Cervantes. Secretary, please call the roll. Romaline Balatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. That motion carries. Thank you. The second program approval is from the Academy of Art University Preliminary Single Subject Intern, Art. Institution has a traditional student teaching based single subject art program, and they are seeking to add the intern pathway. Joining us today from the Academy of Art University to answer any questions you may have about the program are Eileen Everett, Chief Academic Officer, and Katie Rice, Associate Director of the Credential Program. The item was discussed at the October 2022 meeting. And at that time, the COA had a few remaining uh, issues and questions. The proposal this time includes a response to those questions. Are there any recusals on the item? All right, seeing none, would institutional representatives like to say anything about the proposed program? Katie, would you like to say anything at this time? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you for, um, the last meeting was a little challenging for me, um, but I wanted to thank um, all of you for the opportunity to really go back and look at my program and figure out where we still needed to edit and um, alter our program to make it the best program for our students, our future students. Um, and so it was a really great opportunity and I just wanted to Thank you for, even though it was a little challenging, for the opportunity to grow and make my program um, better. And I'm really passionate and know this program is going to be really great for our students. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Mm -hmm. Ms. Everett, would you wish to have any comment? I guess not. All right, any uh, members of the committee have any questions? Member Forbes. Good morning. Well, I don't have any questions. <laughs> in fact, uh, all the questions that I had last time 
were answered in your um, report. And I just really wanted to express my appreciation to you for all the work you put into answering those questions. And I think especially the document that you've created is gonna be a great help to your candidates, having everything very clearly laid out and um, it let, allow everybody to focus on all the wonderful work you do with art, which is the most important part. And I'm so excited that there'll be more art teachers out with our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member have any comments or questions? All right, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the preliminary single subject intern art program from the Academy of Art University? Member Forrest. I move we approve the intern pathway for the uh, Academy of Art University program. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, second by Member Taylor. Any further discussion? All right, Secretary, please call the roll. Jamaline Bilatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hellis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Congratulations, Ms. Everett, Ms. Rice. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. your time and support. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good day. Our third program is from San Francisco State University, the Professional School Nurse Program. Joining us today to answer any questions about the program are institutional representatives, Dr. Elaine Muselman, I'm sorry, as a Musselman Muselman, Director of the School of Nursing, and Dr. Cynthia Grutzik, Dean of the Graduate College of Education. Are there any recusals? All right, seeing none, would the institutional representatives like to say anything about your proposed program? Are they with us? I guess I'll start. Uh, oh, go ahead. Why don't you start, Elaine? That's great. Okay. I just wanted to thank everybody for their time and review and, and consideration of this program. It is really desperately needed in the San Francisco Bay Area and the state of California to keep more school nurses um, working in our schools and caring for our children. So um, thank you for this opportunity and your review. And I'll follow Absolutely. up to just second that. And uh, I thank you, Elaine, for all the work that you've done on this. I know how hard you've worked. Um, also, it's been driven by a great partnership with um, school nurses in the region. Uh, so it's really going to be anchored in those partnerships. This is credential program number 16 for us in the Graduate College of Education Plus uh, in our education unit. And we look forward to folding this credential program into all of our systems, all of our data collection, all of our um, unit meetings. Um, we, we are really happy to have this uh, credential program in the College of Health and Social Sciences joining our education unit. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gritsek. Right, any committee members have any questions or comments? I would just like to say that we know that the, the link was only available the last 24 hours because of the secure, apparently it's security issues at the institution. Um, so I don't know if you need a, a moment or two to, to, to review any additional, uh, if you need any time or not, but I just wanted to let you know that there were, we had technology issues with the getting access to the documents for you. Um, our staff had access and, and the reviewers had access, but um, for, for the purposes of today's meeting. So I don't know if you need any additional time, but. Access, your access through the agenda. Uh, Member Morrison? Yeah, when I tried, uh, you needed an ID number to get in, but I, it looks like that's still the case now. It's on, it's in the agenda. The all the all the passwords are on the in, are listed in the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add that this um, this credential is on our uh, accreditation website. Um, what you'll see is just this credential stuff, but it's um, it's there with all of the other credential programs. So that's the other way that we've folded it in. Um, our analyst is the one who worked with Elaine and her team to make sure everything was visible. So happy to help if it's hard to see. Member Forbes. I can't hear you, Cheryl, sorry. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I was able to access all the links last night and 
Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated the very thorough job that you did. This was a very new program for me. I don't think I've ever seen um, a proposal for a clear uh, nursing credential. So I, I just, um, I, I'm excited that these programs are around. I'm sure there probably needs to be more of them. So, uh, you know, kudos to all of you on all the work that you've done and that you're taking on this challenge it's at a, a now more than ever, right? Thank you, Member Taylor. Uh, I'd like to um, second my colleagues' uh, comments, Cheryl's comments. Um, so important that we have uh, these credentials in these areas where uh, um, there is great need um, and it's very difficult sometimes to uh, um, craft the resources. Speaking from the, uh, the IHE perspective, uh, can be a challenge to put these together and uh, great respect to uh, our colleagues at San Francisco State for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Member Chagowski. Well, I, I, this is like tic-tac-toe. I was going to um, connect this to what we heard earlier about residency and, you know, thinking of the imperative of providing students with a first line of support now more than ever, when we have housing insecurity and food insecurity and a lot of really intense health related concerns magnified in certain communities, it seems to me that if there's any funding available, perhaps a nurse, a school nurse residency program might be a good place to invest some money. Thank you. Mr. And, and, and the reason why I bring that up now is it takes programs like this to help us understand models for dissemination. So thank you for being willing to um, put your work on the books. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Member Cervantes. Uh, no, kudos as well. I got a chance to review it last night. And I started thinking a lot about uh, gainful employment, workforce development, and the idea of being able to draw folks in. And I think it also gives us a chance to see the ecology of schools a little bit different. So uh, thank you for putting this together uh, from an IHE standpoint. I know it takes a lot of work and collab uh, collaboration across colleges, uh, and it's multidisciplinary, multifaceted. Uh, so to both of you, um, thank you for putting this together and for, for pioneering, trailblazing in a way. And thank you. Any further comment or question? Okay, this is an action item. Is there a motion? Uh, Member Cervantes. Uh, motion to approve the San Francisco State University one year clear credential program in nursing. Is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. Any further discussion? Staff, please call the roll. Jomaline Balatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Grisha? Aye. Katrina, Katrina Chikowski? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. All right, motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. It, so Dr. Grudsek, and I want to be sure that I get that, is it Dr. Musselman or Musselman? I, I want to be sure. Musselman. I get that. <laughs> Musselman, okay, thank you. And again, sure, and congratulations you to both of you. Thank you. All right, thank you, have a good day. Item eight is a report of program status changes. Please note there's an agenda insert on the item. So please review the original document that was posted as well as the agenda insert. This item is divided into two parts. Part one includes items for action by the COA, which include requests to withdraw, requests to reactivate inactive programs, and or requests to add a new content area to an existing program. Part two provides information on programs that have transitioned to revised program standards and programs that have elected to change to inactive status. These items are for notification only and require no action by the COA. And there is one correction noted on the item, San Jose State University Education Specialist added authorization, early childhood special education was moved from withdrawal to inactive status. And the correction has been made in the agenda item. So part one, sections A, B, and C. Section A, program withdrawals. Section A is an action item, and there are four program with sponsors withdrawing nine programs. California State University Fresno, Early Childhood Education Specialist, effective January 26, 2023. From San Jose State University, Education Specialist, Added Authorization Autism Spectrum Disorder, effective January 26, 2023. 
Tustin Unified School District closed effective January 26, 2023. Is there a teacher induction effective January 26, 2023? Mills College closed effective on July 1st, 2022. And their programs were education specialist, added authorization, autism spectrum disorder, effective July 1, 2022. Education specialist, added authorization, emotional disturbance, effective July 1, 2022. Education specialist, early childhood special education, effective July 1, 2022. Preliminary multiple subject with intern, effective July 1, 2022. Preliminary single subject with intern, effective July 1, 2022. And preliminary administrative services with intern, effective July 1, 22. And reminder, this is an action item. Are there any recusals? I right, seeing none, is there a motion? And at this point, for the motion, you will not have to go ahead and state every single one like I just did, unless you want bonus points. Remember for us. I move we uh, accept the withdrawal of the professional preparation programs listed in the agenda item. All right, well done. Is there a second? Second by member uh, Hillis. Any further discussion? Oh, we'll do a roll call. Oh, sorry, member Chikoski. Yeah, it, not, not so much discussion, just, just it, makes me, uh, it makes me wonder about reasons for these programs closing, particularly since, um, I mean, I know there's a lot of reasons and maybe this isn't something that we'll talk about now, but I think it, it might be kind of instructive for us to understand um, mm -hmm. if there are trends in terms of why programs decide to withdraw or shut down programs. I mean, I look at the whole set of programs from Mills and it may, just kind of makes me wonder as a, as a member, um, you know, why? Because we're looking to increase the number of, of people we have out there in the field. Sure, I can kind of answer some of that. First of all, Fresno State's um, Early Childhood Ed Specialist was the only one in the state from the old Early Childhood special um, uh, Education Specialist category had no candidates in the program for many years. Um, that is the credential that we took to use for the new PK, PK3 credential. So they were kind of holding on to it to figure out what we were going to do. And then when they realized we were really changing it, they closed it. They'll, if they decide to go for it with the PK3, they'll they'll come in under that. Um, with Mills, Mills actually closed as an institution. So it for financial reasons, for whatever reasons of, on their own, they closed in the entire university. They are being, they're calling it a merger, but it, technically in our book, it's not a merger. They're being acquired by Northeastern University. Um, Northeastern University out of Boston is applying for initial institutional approval to continue programs at the Mills campus in Oakland um, under a new um, designation of Mills College at Northeastern University. So, so you will see that these are coming back in the form of a of some proposals under Northeastern. Um, it should, should they go through successfully the initial institutional approval process. So they're no longer WASC accredited. They'll be under the, the Northeastern um, New England Commission of Higher Education. Um, so, so, so that's, that's the issue there. Um, Holy Names also is closing as an institution. So there's a lot of movement, I think, in the independent sector right now. Um, and so we're, we're kind of working with all of these institutions as they are navigating the world to figure out what happens to their, their credential candidates. Mills did have some candidates still in the program that had not completed their programs when this closed. And we've been working with them. We have a list of names. We asked them, you know, where where are they going? Who is it, who is assuming them? Dominican is taking some of them. Um, Berkeley was apparently taking some of them. So they have been working at a candidate level to make sure that they're they're able to complete their programs. So yeah, that's that's helpful for the la larger landscape. Thank you. I right, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we had a motion by Member Forbes and a second by Member Hillis. Will the staff please call the roll? No, no worries, thank you. So we are on the roll call vote for, for part, our section A. Jomeline Bolatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Gracia? Aye. Petri Katrina Tchaikovsky? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. All right, motion carries, thank you. 
Moving on to section B, programs requesting reactivation. There are no programs requesting reactivation at this time. Section C, adding a new content area. This is an action item, so I'll refer you to the agenda insert for this item. And we do have representatives from San Diego State University available for any questions you may have about the program. Uh, we have Nina Salcedo Potter. Dr. Potter is the Director of Accreditation, Program Review and Assessment. Liz Buffington, Lecturer, and Allison Urban, Professor. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Member Forbes. We can't hear you, Cheryl, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if I was missing something because when I clicked on insert C, it appeared to be the same item. It appeared to be the same text that was on the original item. I didn't see the, I was looking the for the San Diego State Theater proposal. Was that supposed to be agenda? The 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 insert update was for an item in the withdrawals mm -hmm. section. Yeah. Everything else is everything oh. else is the same. Okay. So yeah. when a, so it was me, thank you. Yeah, no, no. When a, so this it's a good question though. So when a, an institution already has a single subject approved program and they're just adding a content area, that is a staff review, and we have not traditionally brought you the documentation. We can certainly do that if you'd like us to do that. But yeah, so it, they've already they've already had a single subject credential program, and they're just adding theater. Um, so they write to the, the paragraph that deals with um, subject specific pedagogy around theater and, and the requirements there. Yes. Does that help? Okay. Just to understand, because a single subject is already in existence, students tend to take a lot of that curriculum, but perhaps there's pedagogy, methodology, exactly, courses, particularly pertaining to theater that. That's correct. Proposed. That's okay. correct. Mm -hmm. All right, any further questions or discussion? All right, any members of the university wish to offer any comment? I just want to thank the staff for reviewing our, our program. We're really excited about adding theater. It'll be um, new for us, but being in San Diego, we have, you know, La Jolla Playhouse. We've got um, Old Globe. So we're, we're super excited about this. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of opportunities for theater in San Diego. Um, any other member of the institution wish to offer a comment? All right, back to us, Member Cervantes. Yeah, just wanted to ask a question maybe to the folks from uh, the uh, university. Uh, does your campus hold a uh, bachelor's in theater or theater arts? And if so, what kind of relationship is sort of there? Just a quick sort of snip of that. I can speak to that. We currently have um, our BA in uh, performance studies, also specifically a BA in youth theater. And that's part of how this came to be. We have so many of the liberal arts students already taking um, our creative drama class, our theater for young audiences class. And there has been a lot of overlap and partnership between the two departments already. So it really was just this natural like, okay, let's do this now. Like, it's perfect. So uh, there is a lot of crossover and support between both uh, schools. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? All right, there is an action item. Will the staff please call the roll? Oh, wait, we have to do a motion. We have to, we have to, I'm sorry, so sorry. Um, we have a motion. Member Forbes. I move we approve the um, addition of theater to the San Diego State University single subject program. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Member Taylor. Staff, please call the roll. Romaline Balatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Krasia. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Charles Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. And thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy the San Diego weather, you lucky people. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. We're now part two, sections D and E. They're for notification purposes only. No action is required. Section D is programs transitioning. 
And for notification purposes, we have California State University, Los Angeles School Psychology, California State University, Sacramento School Counseling, as well as School Social Work, University of Laverne School Counseling, and California State University, East Bay School Counseling. I just wanted to just say that at the last meeting, I think we brought you the whole list of, of the PPS credentials that had transitioned, and there was a handful that still had not completed the process. So these have now completed the process. Um, the one remaining is National University. We have all of their documentation. Um, staff is reviewing it at the moment. Um, so that is the last one. Um, so we'll have that completed hopefully by next week. Okay, thank you. Also, if I may, I apologize, Co-Chair Farley. Um, you did misspeak, and just for public recorded record, the, the CSU East Bay is a school psychology program, not a school counseling program. All right, thank you. So any further discussion on that one? Schedule E, programs moving to inactive status from San Jose State University, education specialist, added authorization, early childhood special education, effective January 26, 2023. Moving on now to item nine. Item nine is initial program approval for new program sponsors. There are no program approvals for new program sponsored at this time. Item 10. Item 10 is discussion of institutions not in compliance with accreditation timelines. Analyst Michelle Bernardo will introduce the item. Ms. Bernardo, will you please begin? So uh, for item 10, for the, uh, just to give an update for program review, we, do, we don't have any late documents to report. Program review documentation was due October 15th for the blue cohort, which were comprised of 33 institutions who participated in the process with a total of 89 programs. So um, every we've received everything. There's no late documents to report. And then Cheryl just mentioned that from the October October meeting of the uh, PPS programs that transition with also an update to National University um, that we still need to review. So that's all for this. Any questions at all from committee members? Okay, thanks, Ms. Bernardo. Um, should we skip item 11? It's chapter three of the accreditation. We'll come back to item 11 just a little bit later on. Do we have the representatives from Imperial County Office of Education available? I could actually get through item oh, okay. 11 pretty quickly. Sure. All right. Really Let's look at item 11. Item okay. 11 is the adoption of revised chapter three of the accreditation handbook. Our administrator, Aaron, Aaron Sullivan, will introduce the item. Ms. Sullivan, will you please begin? Yes, thank you. So um, this item comes to you with sort of a, a great, great big mea culpa in working with staff uh, to get all of the fully revised chapters of the handbook, which were many, <clears throat> put before you at the October meeting. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I inadvertently inserted the incorrect version of chapter three. So since you voted on the whole thing, and then when we posted it, we realized that wasn't actually the most updated version with all of your requests and updates, um, we needed to bring it back to you. So the chapter that's in here now reflects everything that you reviewed throughout the, the year prior to October, all of the updates that, um, that you asked for and everything that staff had proposed. So we just wanna make sure that we get an official vote on the accurate chapter three. Thanks, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, any questions or comments from committee members? Member Forbes. So I, th I really appreciate all the work that's gone into the whole handbook revision, you know, um, by the staff. And I've appreciated the opportunity to discuss it. And I really especially wanted to highlight the uh, revised description of program approval, because ever since I've been on the COA, this is my second term, that's been one of the areas where more questions seem to have arisen among members. And so I think all of the guidance and the clarity is going to be very helpful um, to institutions as well as to those of us on the committee moving forward. So thank you for all that. A good point. Thank you. Any other further questions or comments? This is an action item. Is there a motion from a committee member? Uh, member Hallis. Uh, motion to approve the revised accreditation handbook, chapter three. 
Thank you. Is your second, Member Tchaikovsky. Um, any further discussion? Staff will please call the roll. Jomeline Bilatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Bradley. Aye. Alan Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much for the work on that. Appreciate it. And if I could just say one thing on this, of, of all the handbook chapters, this may be the handbook chapter that we put into regs first. Um, there are lots that are more guidance, but this one is one that I think begs for um, some regulatory language. So um, we'll be looking at that in the future. All right, great, thanks. All right, we are now a few minutes ahead of schedule, but do we have the representatives from Imperial County Office of Education available? Yes. My name is Great. John Lazar. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. All right. Roxanne is on. I see her. Um, if we're ready to go, good morning, committee members. Uh, this report provides information on the actions taken thus far by Imperial. Sorry, Roxanne, County. hold on just a second. We're trying to see if we're, we're still missing one person, it seems. Okay. Michelle, who are we missing? I'm sorry, I missed um, the name. Jeanette, Jeanette Montano, Montano, we're missing here. Director. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to call her right now. I'll call her right now. OK, great. Thank you. OK, well, we then just to, to do the formal announcement. This is the discussion of the six month report from Imperial County Office of Education. Consultant Roxanne Perdue will introduce the item and joining her today are institutional representatives Jeanette Montano, who will be joining us soon, Senior Director of Curriculum and Instruction and John Lazarek, Imperial County Consortium Teacher Induction Program Director. All right. Anyone need to recuse himself? Seeing none, Ms. Perdue, will you please begin? All right. <laughs> Good morning again, committee members. This report provides information on the actions taken thus far by Imperial County Office of Education to address stipulations resulting from their April 25th through 28th, 2022 site visit. Following this decision at the June 2022 meeting, the Committee on Accreditation directed Imperial to provide an update in six months on the progress being made to address stipulations. The accreditation status granted to Imperial in June 2022 was accreditation with stipulations. The following stipulations were placed on the program and work was, has begun to address those stipulations. And so within one year, Imperial County Office of Education's Consortium Teacher Induction Program will provide evidence that number one, site administrators and mentors are collaborating with candidates at the beginning of the induction process by providing input into the development of the goals for the candidate's individual learning plan, also known as the ILP. Number two, a system of collaboration with higher education partners has been established that includes mentors and professional development providers. Number three, mentors are being regularly assessed and evaluated on the quality of services provided by mentors to candidates using criteria that include A, candidate feedback, B, the quality and perceived effect effectiveness of support provided to candidates in implementing their ILP, and C, the opportunity to complete the full range of program requirements. And four, only mentors who represent and support diversity and excellence are retained. A table is provided within the item that outlines the actions taken by Imperial County Office of Education's Consortium Teacher Induction Program thus far to address the stipulations. Staff recommends that the COA accept the six month follow up report and provide any relevant guidance in preparation for the one year final report. Staff will continue to work with Imperial to provide technical assistance in preparation for the final report to be presented to the COA by June 2023. And with that, I'll turn it over to our representatives. I mean, to the I'm sorry, to Bob Bradley. Um, thank you, Ms. Montano. I'm sorry, is it, Ms. Montano is joining us here, I see. And Mr. Lazarsic, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay, great. Perfect. It's an opportunity Lazarsic. for you to, all right, thanks. Opportunity for you to offer any comments you wish to do. 
Sure. We first of all, we appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, allow you guys to view this report, um, which we take very seriously. So we have, we feel we have have a plan and already put some things in place to meet and show evidence that we are addressing all the four stipulations. Um, so the evidence you can see on the right side of the table, we've applied, we've supplied some evidence for you guys. The, the triad meetings are already in place. In fact, they're already having, we started our second cycle through induction program and they're having their second triad meeting with the administrator the mentor and the candidate together in one room, providing feedback to each other. So we feel really strongly that that's, that's doing, and we got some great feedback on that one. Uh, our relationship with San Diego State Imperial Valley to address the second stipulation has always been strong, but now it's even including, um, they're supporting us because uh, we have some candidates that are still need to pass the RECA and the TPAs, and they're offering classes this semester to help those candidates, you know, bridge that gap and, and pass those tests, which we we're really uh, thankful of. And then the last two address the mentors. We have put in place um, some more chances for the candidates to give feedback to us on the mentors, and we're addressing it in that moment. Just had an incident recently where we had to address it with a mentor to, to make sure that our um, candidates are getting the full range of programs and they are being able to enjoy uh, this full induction program. And then the last one with the hiring of mentors representing equity and diversity, that is even that discussion has even gone so far as our local superintendents. Because as a consortium, the each district hires the mentors based on our qualifications, and they also, you know, pay the mentors a certain stipend. So we've had um, that's been an issue because we do require mentors to have about fifty hours of time outside of the regular scheduled workday, and um, so we've we've had conversations with the superintendents. In fact. They invited this back for the February meeting to continue this conversation about how they can support us, making sure that the mentors represent equity and diversity in their programs. So we feel very strongly that we're hitting all the points there. And thank you for this opportunity to for me to share. Thank you, Mrs. Lazarsic. Ms. Montana, would you wish to offer any comment? I'm just very grateful for John uh, Lozarzik. We've been um, meeting a lot. We meet at least twice a week to discuss where we are in the process and um, getting our superintendents to open the doors for meetings. Um, took a little bit of time, but they eventually started and those meetings will continue throughout the year. Once a month, uh, John will continue to provide the updates. I feel um, that he He's done an excellent job in responding to the four stipulations and he's gone above it and beyond with our team. I, the most important thing I feel is that the, the, not only the mentors, but also the advisors and the candidates have provided a lot of feedback because we've been very transparent with our program and the four stipulations that we had or that we have and that we're working on. We've put it at the forefront. Everybody's aware as to why we've um, made changes and, and where we're going with it and for what reason. Um, so that's that's my input. I'm just very grateful that you gave us the opportunity to at least speak uh, uh, to all of you and, and to show you what we've done. Thank you, Ms. Montano. Any committee member have any comments or questions? Member Forbes. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate all the work that I can see you've done already, and uh, especially moving the needle in any way that you can on um, hiring <laughs> uh, mentors who represent diversity, because that's not an easy institutional needle to move often. And it also, you know, I really noticed the direct support for the teacher candidates, so that, uh, uh, I, you know, especially those who need to pass the TPA or the RECA still, that seems like a very important immediate concern. So my question really had more to do with um, the support for mentors. And so I was looking at um, the second stipulation in your um, table, 
when it talks about uh, collaboration with higher ed that includes mentors. And so I can really see how the teacher participants, candidates are included. Uh, when it comes to mentors, I noticed in the last bullet, it says the coordinator, and I'm assuming that that's the San Diego State Imperial Valley Campus Coordinator, is that correct? That that coordinator keeps the county office apprised of um, upcoming professional development opportunities for the candidates and the mentors. And so, you know, that, that seems very positive, but I wondered if there was a sort of a systematic ongoing way that mentors were going to receive professional development support as you look at this particular stipulation. Yes, thank you, Ms. Forbes, for, for asking that question. And if you, in, we, we kind of put it in that last stipulation where, uh, well, first of all, to back up, they do have, I meet monthly with the mentors. So, and that mentor meeting is mainly about how they can better support the candidates, the feedback we're getting from the candidates. Uh, for example, we just had one on Tuesday and we talked about um, the advisors are seeing some kind of gaps in their professional learning goal questions. So the mentors work hand in hand with them. So we had a little bit of PD on, hey, how to write a good professional learning goal program or, or uh, question. Um, so it's typically from me. And just a little feedback as well. Uh, I am replacing someone who did this for 13 years. So, and, I'm, and I love it. I absolutely love this but I'm already thinking about ways to do this, even improve it for next year. And that is specifically for the mentors and how we can better support them. And when one area is giving them some professional development on what equity and diversity is all about, actually kind of showing them how, you know, when you're supporting a candidate, what that looks like, how that, how you can model that for them. Cause we, you know, we, we be, we're, like Jeanette said, we're very open and transparent. We've had some mentors that haven't quite met that. So we see that as a need. So most of that PD will come from us in-house at Imperial County office. Not so much from San Diego State, not that they, we don't want them to do it. Obviously we have love that relationship, but um, we feel it's better coming from us because we have already developed that relationship with the mentors and the advisors and the district leads. So hope that hope that helps, Ms. Forbes. Well, thank you. Um, it, I can see that there's a, a system of support for the mentors. And, and as you say, it's situated in the actual context of their classrooms, which is the most important. But one thing I would point out is that I hope that you can think of collaboration as a two-way street. So it's not only that San Diego State is going to come and do some training of your mentors, but they're going to be learning at the same time <laughs> that they're, and I say this as a program sponsor at the IAG level, right? So this is, this is a collaboration that should help inform both partners. So, you know, I'd encourage you to look for the ways that you can involve your IHG partner in that work, because it's just as important for those of us in the IHG world to have that communication with the district partners as it is for them to communicate with the IHGs. For you, <laughs> I want to say them, for you to communicate with the IHGs. So anyway, thank you for all that work. I got to spend the summer in the Imperial Valley one time doing professional development, so I, it's uh, actually dear to my heart. Summer, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you much for that feedback. And I know it's also hot here in the summer, so you get to experience that. <laughs> but thank you for that. I am taking copious notes. I really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Coach Chair Martinez. I just, um, so first, uh, Member Forbes asked a lot of my questions, or one of them. But um, the other piece, you know, when you think about um, several of your stipulations really are around collaboration with IHEs, collaboration with administrators. And then really that, that deepening that collaboration and relationship with mentors as you evaluate them. So thinking about the last six months since or since April when you had your your site visit, what have you learned or where have you what are the positives you've seen in terms of, of your program, um, what you've learned and in, and in informing your future direction? Great question. And we were just talking about that yesterday with the advisors. One positive that has been palpable is that we 
we brought both the mentors and the candidates back together face to face at the beginning of the year during the enrollment period where they got a chance to sit together. It was a full day. They got a chance to sit together, start thinking about their ILP, start thinking about what their goals are going to be. And if they haven't really had that connection yet, start building that connection together. And the feedback we've gotten from the district leads and the advisors has been very positive. In fact, one of them just commented yesterday that the, the, a lot of the issues they had over the last two years due to COVID and maybe a lot of things going Zoom haven't cropped up this year. So, and part of it is, I th- and, they, and a lot of them, I ask them, well, why? And a lot of them say, we believe it was at the beginning of the year, we set the tone. We had six separate enrollment meetings to accommodate over 188 people because we have 87 mentors and 101 candidates. And so we allowed them to pick and choose over a course of six dates. But they had to be, the one stipulation was that they had to be there with their candidates together in the same room. And we provided a little PD, but a lot of it was just the nuts and bolts of induction, making sure they understand the ILP, who to share it with, the professional agreements that they have to sign, all the, the, the things that go on behind the scenes. So that was a, to me, that was a great start to, to the year, have that face to face. I got a chance to see everybody, meet everybody. And then continue with the mentors is these monthly mentor meetings. So we also have offered a lot of um, choices to join the meetings because it's, it's kind of at a different, difficult time from four to five. So we've offered three ways to join the meetings that we have face to face, which most people attend. I offer a Zoom uh, meeting as well. And then I also have a screencast where I screencast the meeting. So we also have offered different, (coughs) sorry, avenues for the mentors to engage um, with our meetings and the content of of those meetings. So um, so if I'm I'm going to point to one thing, it was setting the tone at the beginning of the year that hadn't happened for a while because of COVID. And again, the feedback we're getting is that things are, um, running a lot smoother than they had been in the past. So I hope that answers your question. And and I like to add to that, John. Um, I also feel that at the beginning, when seeing the four stipulations, it didn't feel good. You know, uh, it was a feeling of oh my goodness, we're going to have to really look at this. But as we started looking at our program and really zoning in on those areas that were pointed out to us, it made a world of a difference. And just the way we think and the way we strategize to make a better system for our candidates, right? We're trying to create the best system for them. And we honestly thought we had a Cadillac model. And little did we realize when we were digging in, well, no, there were some things that we needed to change. And it's been an eye opener. Um, we also have discussed, John and I have talked about, this is not going to happen happen again, right? We We need to really dive in into our program and getting that feedback from everybody involved, you know, that that they call it street data, right? You know, who's involved on a day-to-day, gather the data so that we know that we're on the right track Um, because it's, it's just in thinking about all of the teachers that are struggling to pass the RECA and the CSETs right now is the, the number is overwhelming. And, and, you know, we've been zoning in, in on that piece also and really making connections with some of the professors out at San Diego State Imperial Valley um, uh, campus. Uh, so, yes, we are, we're thinking strategically and very different now. And this is John's first year really taking over the program. And it's made a world of a difference to have fresh eyes. You know, we having it for so long, you know, you can, you can, it can, it can become remote and we don't want that. Thank you very much. That does answer my question. You know, and it's especially challenging being part of a consortium. So you're trying to create a system across multiple LEAs. And so uh, um, I appreciate that. Um, And I would just one last recommendation is that you, if you haven't already, that you attend the induction conference that's coming up in a couple of weeks, because it's a great chance to learn more. Thank you both. We're signed up for it. So thank you for that. Awesome. And thank you, Ms. Montano, for your comments about uh, the feeling of the shock of seeing stipulations and recognizing 
uh, what that means and taking it as it is intended as an opportunity for growth. So thank you so much for the comments. We appreciate that. Member Tchaikovsky. Yeah, just briefly, um, I thought it would be helpful to, first of all, I just wanted to to comment on the third um, artifact you have posted under the second stipulation there, the mentor support plan. Um, I think it's commendable and ambitious to have all of your mentors uh, setting goals and being observed. This is not something that happens everywhere. So member Forbes talked about the classroom and that being kind of the focal point for mentor development. I think this relates to previous comments about challenges that new teachers face. Um, new teachers need to be working with really expert classroom teachers. It's it's obviously prerequisite, right? And then they need to work with mentors who are able to coach them, which is, I think, in my opinion, secondary, but equally important um, in terms of induction. So I wanted just to highlight that. I think that is that is a, a gem in your um, plan. I commend you for for using that in a in a consortium complex system. Uh, and, and I guess I would just ask you to think about how you might calibrate expectations for proficiency or expertise among your mentors, given the data that you can, in fact, collect from their goal setting skills and um, actual evidence of effective instruction. You know, what does that look like out in your very unique, awesome, challenging part of the, the state? You know, what do you need your teachers to be able to do? Do they need to effectively address the needs of English learners and which mentors can, in fact, do that well? So I think that that will just um, having those conversations around instruction will be uh, helpful uh, for the collaborative goals that you've set for your program. Thank you. Thank you, Member Tchaikovsky. Any other committee member have any comment or question? Member Taylor. Um, I'd like to uh, reiterate my colleagues who commended you on um, uh, the work that you've done to this point. It's evident looking through this that um, uh, you've done a lot of work and you've taken this uh, in the spirit it was intended. Um, and uh, and I'm truly, uh, um, truly supportive of, uh, uh, of the work that you're doing. Um, there's a, a, a link to a flyer. Um, uh, that calls out Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, which is fabulous. I'm from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and uh, um, we're very supportive. A uh, um, couple of comments on there. One, it sort of sounds like uh, um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo is helping uh, um, any folks in the entire state who are uh, um, uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, I think it overstates uh, what w we are able to offer with the resources we have available. Uh, um, uh, we certainly will support, fully support any candidate that didn't complete uh, their, their TPA uh, during the pandemic. Uh, um, and uh, we offer a lot of support to uh, people calling in with general questions. Uh, and uh, um, I, 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 support my staff in answering lots and lots of people calling in with general questions because we're a state university um, and we're, we're in, in that regard we're a state resource and we strive to uh, be helpful to anyone that calls in uh, um, but we do get a lot of that traffic and so some rewording of how Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uh, is a partner and can be supportive uh, may be appropriate. Um, uh, and the uh, the QR codes in your flyer uh, could be more helpful. For example, the one with San Luis Obispo uh, and Cal Poly takes you to the uh, the Cal Poly website, and it would be more helpful to have it take you to the School of Education uh, website where you could look up uh, um, uh, specific individuals that might be able to uh, be helpful. The SDSU one as well. Um, uh, the text uh, leads you to believe that it's taking you to one part of the SDSU website and it takes you to a different part. So um, there's some tweaks, uh, I think, that you could make to that flyer that would make it more helpful. Uh, uh, again, I don't want it to sound like I'm nitpicking because uh, uh, that is not my intention. My intention is to be supportive. My intention is to call out the hard work that you are doing. Um, and um, uh, I'm no doubt will continue to do. Uh, 
and to commend you in your attitude towards uh, um, embracing this opportunity uh, to improve and um, uh, help your uh, candidates um, more comprehensively. Um, thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Member Cervantes. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you wish to offer a response to that? I'm sorry, I, Mr. Lizardo. I just, I just want to say, and this is where I'm going to give Jeanette Montano, my supervisor, a lot of credit, is that, yeah, we we, uh, we want our mentors to get feedback, but we need feedback as well. So we, Mr. Taylor, thank you so much. I'm taking notes. We want to get better, and that feedback is going to help us. So we really appreciate that. I don't think it's nitpicking. I think it's great feedback for us to just get better. And I appreciate that you took the time to, to dive into that and gave us that feedback. So we will definitely make those changes. And again, we appreciate that. Thank you. Terrific. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to staff at San Luis Obispo for, uh, uh, to um, proofread stuff and, and, and talk about it. Our, our credential analysts are part of the state group that, that collaborate regularly to try and uh, provide uh, good support to candidates calling in. Uh, there have been a lot of changes um, uh, over the last couple of years that, uh, and people um, um, really legitimately have a lot of questions. So uh, happy to help in any way we can. Thank you, Member Cervantes. Uh, yeah, no, just to add and first and foremost, commend you for the work put in and for taking the recommendations as, as you did. I, I would say in California, more than a two-tier system, we almost have a three-tier system where the third tier is when we expect working teachers to serve as mentors for new teachers. It's, it, it, it's an unspoken rule, especially for the good ones, right? Um, and so uh, I love it when it's ambitious. Uh, working with a program sponsor, I know how hard it is to not only identify those mentors with the right dispositions just because you teach well doesn't mean you know how to mentor or coach well right and we all know that but i think what's what's clearly evident is that you're leaning in uh to what it would mean uh to have equitable mentorship uh in a complex uh consortium um so it's gonna look a little different in many different parts but i think by being ambitious you're gonna be able to hone in and sort of right size will make sense and what's feasible uh, in the different areas you're going to be supporting. So sometimes you got to start big and, and push big, and then eventually you'll land where you will. So commending you both for, for doing that work and for uh, seeing us as thought leaders, thought partners more so than anything else, and, and for doing the work. Uh, that part uh, we certainly need to commend you for. Uh, I've gotten a chance to do a little bit of work in your area, and I know it's complicated. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, so it almost felt like a new version of LA with many, many intricacies. So I'm glad you all have gotten a chance to really do this work and, and, and keep it going and also teach us. I mean, I think uh, for a lot of us, especially your IHE partners, let them know what's working and let them know what they can also do better so that we are producing from the onset a candidate that subscribes to the three-tier system I'm talking about, to being a practitioner, to developing themselves as practitioners, and then eventually developing themselves as mentors of future practitioners. Thank you, Member Cervantes. Any other committee member? All right, seeing none, this is an action. Is there a motion? Member Taylor. I moved that the COA accept the sixth monthly report from the Imperial County Office of Education. Thank you. So moved. Uh, Member Tchaikovsky, second. Any further discussion? Staff, will you please call the roll? John Maline Aye. Augustin Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Kresha? Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky? Aye. Charles Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. All right, motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Lazar Sick and also Ms. Montano. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Purdue. Thank you, Thank you guys so much. And Roxanne, appreciate your support as well. That can't go unnoticed. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for saying so. All right. Have a good day. We are looking at item 13, uh, which is uh, for Cal State Bakersfield. I would like to let the those folks who are going to be on the West Side Union School District, we're going to take a brief break after this presentation, probably about five minutes. 
just to get up and stretch. So we're going to be a little bit behind on item 14. So just to kind of give you a heads up. Item 13 is the report of the accreditation team to Cal State University of Bakersfield. Consultant Pudam Beatty will introduce the item, and she is joined virtually by team lead Nina Potter and institutional representative Dr. Yu Jun Chi, I'm sorry, Yu Ju Lee, Chair of Advanced Education. Also joining us in person are representatives from CSU Bakersfield, Dr. James L. Rodriguez, Dean, School of Social Sciences and Education, Dr. Didi Perez Granados, Associate Dean, Debbie Meadows, Director of Education Assessment and Accreditation, and Dr. Bree Evans Santiago, Chair of Teacher Education. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Beatty, would you please begin? All right. Good morning, committee members. Morning. morning. Item 13 presents the accreditation site visit team's report for CSU Bakersfield. This was a concurrent site visit with the national accrediting body, AQIP, the Association for Advancing Quality in Educator Preparation, and the first hybrid concurrent visit um, as the AQIP team was in Bakersfield in person and the CTC team was virtual. The site visit occurred November 6th through 9th in 2022. Sarah Solari, uh, sorry, Sarah Solari Colombini and I were the co-consultants on this visit. Sarah is unable to join today. So I'll express from both of us the gratitude to CSU Bakersfield for hosting the site visit. A special thanks to Debbie Meadows for her work in coordinating the accreditation process for the institution and for facilitating the process to address questions, provide documents or interview requests that the team had during the site visit. Coordinating the logistics of a concurrent hybrid site visit is a complicated process. So we're grateful to Debbie and all the CSU Bakersfield leadership and staff and faculty that gave their time to prepare and participate in the site visit. We would also like to thank the site visit team members for their time, their grace, their patience, their expertise, and their openness in conducting concurrent interviews with their AQIP colleagues during the site visit. We're also grateful for our team lead, Nina, for setting clear expectations of the team and for supporting each and every team member. She worked persistently to ensure the report reflects the findings of the team against the respective standards. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Nina to provide her thoughts on the site visit and then walk through the team's findings. Hi, everybody. Hi again. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to share a summary of the accreditation uh, visit and review. Um, first, I want to thank Dean Rodriguez and the entire CSU Bakersfield School of Social Science and Education faculty and staff for their time and organization for a successful visit. I also want to acknowledge Debbie Meadows for the leadership coordinate. Uh, leading the coordination of the visit, which, as uh, Poonam mentioned, was a little trickier than most, as it was the concurrent visit with AQIP and a hybrid visit. Um, aside from a few late starts due to technical difficulties, everything went well, and team members were able to get the information that they needed to come to a decision on all of the standards across all programs. I also want to thank the, um, the site visit team for their time and thoughtful review and discussion leading to our final decisions, and of course, the CTC consultants, Panam, um, who made sure everyone had what they needed and helped me in navigating my first time as a team lead. Um, so one of the things that really stood out most during the visit was how much the community relies on CSUB for not only training their new education professionals, but for continued professional development of the current educators in the districts. I heard the term symbiotic relationship a number of times during interviews. Um, I feel that CSUB embodies that part of standard one that requires institutions to collaborate with their PK-12 partners, that they're doing that so well. Um, another thing that stood out was their commitment to using data for continuous improvement. They have strong programs, but they know that there are always areas for improvement and that they need to change and update programs as the needs of the community change. And lastly, I have to talk about the residency programs. Candidates and district partners could not express their happiness with these programs enough. Um, and the success of these programs is due to the first two things I spoke about, their collaborative relationship with the local schools and their commitment to continuous improvement. 
um, the districts choose to work with CSUB because they know that CSUB will do their best to meet their needs. They will listen to their feedback and make changes as needed. Um, as you know from the report, we found all common standards to be met and all program standards to be met with two met with concerns for the multiple single subject programs. Um, the part of standard one where we had concerns only affected single subject candidates in low incidence areas such as PE and music. While CSUB has a plan in place for addressing pedagogical methods for all subject areas, during interviews, some candidates in these fields reported they felt they weren't getting all the support they needed. Um, and then the part of standard four that was met with concerns had to do with the support for traditional and intern candidates. And in interviews with these candidates, they reported that they were sometimes unsure about who they were supposed to go to when they had questions. And um, it wasn't always clear which requirements they'd met and which requirements were outstanding. Um, so the team as a whole, we made the recommendation for accreditation based on the confidence we have that CSU Bakersfield was already taking steps to address the concerns that we identified and the fact that CSU Bakersfield provided many examples showcasing its responsiveness to the needs of its candidates and the community. So in end, the team recommends that CSUB receives full accreditation based on these findings. I look forward to answering any questions the members may have about the visits. All right, thank you, Ms. Potter for the detailed report and thank you, Ms. Beatty. Uh, we now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment about the report. We remind you it's not the time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts you have about the visit itself. Thank you. Good morning. My name is James Rodriguez. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and Education at California State University, Bakersfield. It is a pleasure to be able to be here with you this morning along with members of my of my leadership team. I want to begin by thanking uh, Sarah Solari Colombini, Hunam Betty, and Nina Potter for um, their work with us. Um, it was a wonderful ex multi-month experience that culminated in a virtual site visit in November. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge and thank not only the individuals who are here joining us this morning, but also the entire faculty and staff. It was all hands on deck. Everyone responded with commitment and grace. In regards to the report, what I will say is that we had a very productive um, hybrid visit, um, as I believe was previously mentioned, where we also had AQIP um, in person simultaneously. Um, and it was a visit that affirmed things that we thought were going on, but also allowed us to continue to think about ways in which we could better serve the region, the children, families, and communities of Kern County, Tulare County, Northern Los Angeles County, and wherever else our programs reach. We do play a critical role um, at Cal State Bakersfield in this regard. Um, we, uh, we, we immediately, uh, in order to be proactive, I will share with you this morning that uh, we do have, uh, in terms of addressing some of the areas of concern, we had already some measures in place as uh, Nina uh, shared during her report um, and we have moved forward with those measures. I will not go into those into detail, but I'm happy to, if you have questions about any of those things that we are putting into place uh, in our efforts to not only better serve, but our own professional efforts towards continuous improvement across all programs that we offer in education at Cal State Bakersfield. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Any other member of the uh, institution wish to offer any comment? <laughs> All right, no worries. Uh, opportunity for discussion from COA members. Member Forbes. Well, first of all, congratulations again on a successful and very complex visit, as well as all the great work that is very evident in, in the document and, and for being here today, both in person and virtually. So it's not really a, I guess it is a question, but 
um, I noticed that your bilingual authorization program was already meeting the 20 hours of field work that is now going to be required for all programs. And particularly because you offer the post prudential model, um, you know, I was just curious, there, there was some information in the report about things that you'd found useful, but do you have any other insights or recommendations for the rest of us who are implementing this new requirement? Things that you've got that you've learned that have been really helpful or successful? Sure, I'm going to ask Debbie Meadows to respond to that. Thank you for that question. And I must uh, call out Dr. Adam Sawyer, who is our coordinator for that program, has served on, on the commission uh, group to, to set these new standards. One of the things that we do intentionally at CSUB is partnership. And as we revised that bilingual program several years ago, we wanted those candidates, many of them already in service teachers, to have that opportunity to be engaged in the classroom. And because we have a very high English learner population, we have a very receptive group of districts who said, please come in, please come in. So for us, that was just an easy yes. And we encourage you just to build those relationships, to keep moving forward with those relationships with district partners, to, to get them to say, yes, we want this. And, and I give Dr. Sawyer a lot of credit for that. Well, thank you for that. And um, I was on the same panel with Dr. Sawyer, so it was really exciting to see this in action and learn from your previous experience, even before transitioning. So I hope you'll share with Cobte and Cabe and other uh, venues so we can all learn. Thank you. What, what I what I will add is that um, we're one of the things that I have uh, been very supportive of and also been communicating with our partners in various districts, but also in the community, various communities that we serve. Uh, the communities of Kern County and beyond are not monolithic. And when it comes to English learners is that uh, not only do I support the work, as a previous director of a, a bilingual program at San Diego State, but also um, that we must work diligently with intent and purpose to expand opportunities, to create more bandwidth, if you will. So this is an area that it's not only what we have done and what we are doing, but it is really about where we, want, where we would like to go with it and where we will go with it. So this is an area that uh, we will continue to work to develop. Okay, thank you. Member Morrison? Uh, also, I'd like to congratulate you on, on the report. Uh, uh, when I started reading this and I thought that, saw that there'd be 935 people interviewed for this report, I, I knew it was going to be complicated. <laughs> um, hybrids and concurrent, um, again, uh, congratulations. Um, my question is just to, um, in the report, you were saying uh, there was a, a couple of uh, concerns in the report, uh, and um, we were told that you've already started to address those things. Could you just, just briefly say what that was and wh what is it that you're doing differently? Sure. So I'll, I'll provide a couple of examples uh, just for because of the time. Uh, one example is that we had already identified a position that we were going to create uh, to provide advising to credential candidates. Uh, this position uh, um, has been signed off. It, it takes time within the university, but it's been signed off. And I'm hoping that human resources will post the position as early as next week. Um, and so uh, that's one example of creating additional support services for our credential students and our programs overall with the addition of a position, a student services position. Uh, a second example is that uh, we, uh, we, we are, uh, as has been noted, we have incredible partnerships to the credit of the faculty, uh, to the credit of, of the faculty who engage in leadership in developing various programs and leading those programs. Uh, and so we work very closely with teachers to come in and provide instructional support uh, for our programs, whether the uh, whatever whatever program it might be. And so, as dean, what I have done is in working with the faculty, uh, 
or with the chairs of the two departments is that uh, we are upping um, the level of commitment that we're making in this regard so that we will now be hiring um, some of the uh, K through 12 instructors. Um, and there, there, are some, there are some nuances that, are, that we have to work out, but essentially the idea is to compensate them uh, and, to, and to formalize their role uh, within the program, which I believe will strengthen the program of, overall, not just from a curricular, not just from the experience of the student in the classroom, but just overall in regards to tight, uh, tightening even more our collaborations and our partnerships uh, with, uh, with uh, K through 12 folks in the area. So those are two examples. Hey, thank you, Member Hillis, then Member Balatayo. I'm just curious if, if you could reflect a little bit on the AQEP process. A, a number of institutions are now beginning to look at this as they've kind of left CAPE. And, and I, I'm not sure if this is the first uh, institution that, that's come before us. No, CSU Fresno. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious because I know um, all of us would like to know how that process is going, what your experience is like, um, and just, you know, just any general uh, comments about that. I'll say a couple of words and then I'm gonna pass it along to Debbie Meadows. Um, and what I will say is that from my perspective, the way that the faculty uh, talk about working with AQIP and the faculty experience with the process, uh, demonstrates to me that it is well worthwhile. Um, it is aligned. It, we have been able to align uh, the AQIP process with other, with with the greater vision for where we where we would like to be in the future. Uh, one example is our work in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. So we've been able to use the AQIP process and also the CCTC process. We've been able to use these processes to go deeper um, in regard to our conversations about how we're going to engage in this work moving forward. So um, I'm gonna pass it along to Debbie Meadows, uh, who I'm sure will be able to say much more. Uh the AQIP process allows us to really look at our local context, as the Dean said. Um, we have the opportunity to share quantitative data, qualitative data, which I think we intentionally in California look at through that interview process when we do site visits. So it is, it is very much aligned with the thought process of moving forward with continuous improvement. Um, other accreditors at times really want to drill down to just the numbers, but education is so much more than the numbers. And AQIP really allows us to take those numbers, look at them, and then go find out what they really mean and, and put, those place, put those pieces in place in a way that works for us and also works for our local area. You know, our, our service areas are, are rich and diverse and that doesn't always drill down to numbers. And we very much appreciate that opportunity to work with them and in collaboration with CTC. Can I use this one? Okay. Um, as a writer on the both <laughs> um, accreditation reports um, and also the chair of, of a multiple and single subject, it really helped me um, affirm what we're doing. It felt good to look through and say, look, we got this, we're doing this. And it was in a format that we were able to cross check and everything like that. But it also... Um, and I think at, from the leader perspective, help me see like what we need to do next and what else. And it was just easy and laid out as we worked and dug deeper into areas to be able to make plans and already start moving forward using continuous improvement and just thinking about next steps. So I strongly recommend that chair directors or what have you be a part of that process. Um, you know, we had a lot of faculty involved, but it does definitely help to have you know, a leader involved to help make those next decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Member Palatayo. Um, this was piggybacking on uh, Member um, Morrison's um, question regarding supporting K-12 teachers. Um, I just wanted to follow up with regards to the, um, the, the candidates at your Antelope Valley satellite and to um, ask um, 
what your steps are in um, bolstering support for them also, because they're not technically on campus, but they're still under your um, uh, under your auspices. Sure, appreciate that question. So Antelope Valley is geographically distant uh, from uh, Bakersfield. Um, it's also geographically a very different place, um, very different context, local educational context. Um, we do have support staff at the Antelope Valley campus um, that are dedicated to our education enterprises. But the other thing is that there is a dean of the Antelope Valley campus. And uh, we recently, uh, a, a, new, a new dean was recently appointed, Elizabeth Adams, who comes to us from Cal State Northridge. And so Dean Adams and I have already initiated conversations about how the dean role at Antelope Valley campus can be transformed. And part of that transformation is to work more closely with, uh, with us to, to tighten up the connections between what we do at the Bakersfield campus and the Antelope Valley campus. And to uh, and so it's kind of, this is also a bigger, the question's a bigger one because we have many other programs at the Antelope Valley campus and the School of Social Sciences and Education which has 10 departments and three academic programs all together. It's a very diverse school. And so, but the majority of the Antelope Valley enrollment are students who are either in our education programs or other programs within social sciences and education. So, so a part of this is to look at the existing structure, but also how roles have defined, including the Dean role at Antelope Valley campus. I don't wanna to get too far ahead of it, because we're just starting this conversation, but we are looking at various ways in which we can strengthen the ties between the two campus. And we have, the re we have a residency there. We do have a new residency there, um, which is a very significant uh, thing. And, and we are increasing our presence in other education programs as well there. The, the other thing that I was going to mention is that, um, we also uh, are looking at um, various procedures and protocols, um, how things work on the Bakersfield campus versus the Antelope Valley campus to ensure that there is ample, effective cross-communication. Um, and so, and so there, there is a lot of work to do in that area, but we, we are very, again, it's, it's something that it, I believe we need to be proactive about and and we and so those conversations have already begun, and I anticipate that uh, they will be fruitful um, in the near in the near future. Appreciate the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Member Chagoski. Uh, thank you all for being here. And my comment is really brief. Um, we've talked as a group about exemplary programs, and I just wanted to thank you for being here to talk with us um, to help us really get a sense of beyond the report, who you are and how you roll. And I would say, you know, the word leadership really rises to the forefront of my summary of listening to you, um, especially you, Dr. Rodriguez, because I mean, there's vision, there's teamwork, there's content knowledge, there's attention to detail. There's a lot of things required to bring diverse state, you know, people together um, and take them into the next place. So um, I, I hope we're all kind of attending to your team as it moves forward as a model from which a lot of other um, programs in the state can learn. So thank you all online and here. It's inspiring. Thank you, Member Cervantes. Uh, no, likewise, just commending all of you for your work. I think it, it goes what I was saying, whenever you do a review, it's not just your dean, your associate dean, and, and it's a cast of characters that are really orchestrating a lot of that work. And we need to acknowledge them all. And then more importantly, when we try to draw out our community and your community is so vast, considering the differences, the intricacies, et cetera, um, you're, de you're dealing with an urban rural landscape and an amalgamation of a lot. Um, so commending you for that. 49 school districts. Um, we deal with some CSUs that work with one school district and that's already a difficulty. Um, 
Uh, so it's so it's important to realize that. Um, uh, I appreciate the student support service uh, thoughts and how do we professionalize that and and with the teaching credentials and credentials at large because you're dealing with a uh, sort of I, I I think as colleges of ed we need to call ourselves professional schools and so Andrew Goji needs to come into play on how we conduct our services and as much as we have faculty pulling themselves in with the community with curriculum, with the design, we can be stretching our folks uh, thin. So I appreciate that you wanna have professional advising and folks that can guide and shepherd students uh, through those processes. Um, but I, I had a, a question that's more stemming out of curiosity as a, uh, I work with a program sponsor myself uh, at Cal State LA. Um, what are some other innovative ideas we can all concoct? We deal with the same concern of uh, single subjects and small numbers, and we're trying to make it work in sort of a consortium type model. Um, there's simulated learning out there. Uh, there are ways in which uh, we can perhaps work with, uh, and we had an example from San, San Diego State today of a partnership with, say, an academic department, the School of Education coming together and providing those services. Um, just wanted to open that up if there were any thoughts on things you might want to try to continue to run your ship right and not stretch your folks too thin right. So um, I'm sure that uh, others on the team may uh, will also have comments, but um, two, two things that I'll share. One is since my arrival as Dean at Cal State Bakersfield, uh, I've put an emphasis on a number of things, but one that I'll highlight is not just our partnerships with uh, local school districts. Uh, again, a large number of school districts. We do have a vehicle called the Current Education Pledge, which is, so I've, this is the third county, this is my third CSU, and each of the counties has some type of consortium, but the current pledge is different. And so that vehicle allows for um, for certain things to happen um, and provides opportunities as well. But aside from the current education pledge, I've also tried to engage in, with various communities in Kern County, uh, communities that may be well represented in the current education pledge or maybe not so well represented, communities that may be well represented in our undergraduate and credential and graduate programs, and maybe not so well represented. And that's a commitment that I've made clear from the start. Um, even at the time of my interview, Dr. Evan Santiago was part, was the co-chair of the committee, of the search committee. And so, so I think that community outreach um, is, uh, it's really about community engagement. It's really about trying to figure out ways that we can effectively, more effectively serve. It's about how Cal State Beckersfield can become a more serving institution. Uh, the second thing that I'll, went a little long with that one, but the second thing that I'll share is that going back to the Kern Education Pledge um, and thinking about Kern County and the opportunities that are there, but also the challenges, being Dean of the School of Social Sciences and Education in which there are eight other departments and three other academic programs across disciplines, and in which 50% of the students are enrolled in at Cal State Bakersfield, I have all I have put out there that there are incredible opportunities for us to work together to to make to create greater opportunities not for our not just for our credential programs, not just for our master's programs and our doctoral program, but also overall for the students who attend Cal State Bakersfield. And again, it's all with the idea of how do we serve the communities of Kern County? How do we serve the children and families um, who again come from rich, diverse places, are engaging in diverse ways and in which we um, have more work to do because we are there to serve. Um, I'm going to pass it along. Uh, Dr. Evan Santiago, do you want to say, would you like to say something? Um, so I was just um, thinking a lot of what we do, especially thinking about single subject, right? Um, collaboration with various entities, um, honestly, across the nation. We work with teaching works. And so a lot of our faculty, um, all single subject faculty are trained 
um, through teaching works, which is um, utilizing simulations, um, using that, that model process where you stop and think and discuss right then of what happens as you're teaching or what have you. And so um, I didn't really think about that before, Agustin. We have all of these various um, pathways and collaborations that we utilize all the time, but it's just an everyday part of our lives. So those are things that we need to think about to just highlight and to discuss that we are um, not only professionally developing on our own, but we are taking those entities and putting them in spaces that absolutely need it. And so we know where single subject lies and how important it is to ensure that they're learning the methods within their content area and getting that those practices however we can. So I'm really excited about those collaborations with the partners for sure. Um, but then also, you know, there could be options where um, in elementary, we have like literacy nights and going out to the field and going to classes or what have you. We could think about that even with single subject. What do we do? What kind of family nights do they have? What kind of meetings or what have you community events that our single subject teachers can also be a part of? So that's something to think about. But currently we have a residency that actually provides 28 of our 50 teachers that are in single subject, a space and the practice. So then we have this other small group of, you know, less than 30 that we have to make sure that we provide those opportunities for as well. So thank you for helping us think about um, other ideas that we can continue to work with. Thank you all. Um, we need to move on. I enjoyed the discussion. We're running a little bit behind. So at this point, what we'd like to do is entertain a motion from any of the committee members. Member Relatayo. Um. I propose that we accept the, um, I'm sorry, um, accept this, that we accept this report of accreditation for California State University Bakersfield. Thank you. Is there a second? Member Taylor, any further discussion? The staff, please call the roll. Jomeline Balatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Katrina, Katrina Chakowsky? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Franley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. Our motion carries unanimously. Congratulations for outstanding work. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Beatty, and also Ms. Potter. And Dr. Yu, thank you, or Dr. Lee, excuse me, thank you for being online. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to take a quick uh, five minute break. So we are a little bit behind. And I would just, um, yeah, let's take five minutes and we'll come back and we'll get started again. Everyone be sure you back on camera and that the mic on your computer is off. And we thank those who've been waiting patiently to, to join us. We're gonna reconvene our meeting here. Um, as we move forward, uh, some of these discussions are very rich and enjoyable and, and really, really great detail. Um, just in the essence of time, since we're starting to back up a little bit, I think as people offer comments, if you have something new to share that somebody hasn't already asked the question, I think that'd be great to do that. Uh, but again, we, we want to acknowledge the efforts of the work that the institutions are doing and that they certainly deserve, but at the same time, acknowledge the time of everybody else we have to, uh, lining up behind us. So, okay. Item 14 is the report of the accreditation team to West Side Union School District. Consultant Christina Nahara will introduce the item. Joining her this morning is team lead Christine Sisko and institutional representatives, Dr. Shannon Rosal Bennett, Director of New Teacher Support, Regina Rosal, Superintendent, and Robert Hughes, Deputy Superintendent and Program Supervisor. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Nahar, will you please begin? Good morning, committee members. It's a pleasure to be here this morning with all of you in person. Um, I uh, am happy to present uh, with uh, Christine Sisko the um, report for the Westside Union School District site visit, which took place October 10th through 12th, 2022 for their teacher and administrator induction programs. I'd like to first recognize the hard work and professionalism of the site visit team members, Beth Cradipole, Rayanne Lopez-Little, and Celia York, whose review of the evidence leading up to and during the visit 
made for a well-informed and unanimous decision during team deliberations. The team's organization, communication, and focus, along with the outstanding leadership and guidance of our team lead, Christine Sisko, led to a thorough review of Westside's high quality and standards-based induction programs. I would also like to uh, thank and recognize the extraordinary work Mm -hmm. of Dr. Shannon Russell Bennett, the Director of New Teacher Support, her team and the district leadership for accommodating the visit with no technical glitches and seamless participation of all program constituencies. As we all know, preparing for a site visit is quite a heavy lift. It was a pleasure working with Dr. Russell Bennett who made it look easy. During the year leading up to the visit, I not only learned about Westside Union and their induction programs, but also quite enjoyed swapping stories with Shannon whose son shares the same interest and humor as my kiddos. I'd now like to welcome Christine who will review the team's findings. Thank you, Christina. Um, First, thank you for having us here today. Um, I actually enjoy these site visits very much because it keeps my um, hand and my perspective, et cetera, really well grounded. So thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate in another site visit. Thank you, Dr. Shannon Russell Bennett and her staff at our hospitality organization and availability. Um, Christina was not kidding when she said this went off without a technological glitch. I mean, it was so smooth, smooth. It was beautiful. Our accreditation visits are intense and rigorous, and they ensure the education prep programs meet the standards set forward by the commission, um, which is really important in maintaining that high level of quality across the state. So Dr. Rose Bennett's dedication and commitment to the development of professional practice was evident throughout this review. The staff that she has been able to hire has further benefited the program and ultimately has exponentially increased the quality and capacity of both the teacher and the administrator induction programs. The growth mindset and positive collaborative culture are pervasive throughout this district from the superintendent to the interaction of human resources and services, site administration and induction. It was really impressive to see that cohesive pull of of culture and climate that is difficult difficult to get in larger systems. This was evidenced by the commitment to ongoing professional development and frequent collaboration, which has developed a shared language and focus on best teaching practices and best leading practices. The leadership of the West Side Unified School District models the professionalism and behaviors expected for all educators in the district. We saw the leaders walking the walk and talking the talk as much as we saw the teachers doing the same. The main thing that stands out about WUSD is the extensive impact that the induction programs are having on the new teachers, leaders, and that district culture in general. Investing in your teachers and new leaders lets them know that they are a valuable part of the larger system and keeps everyone focused on the ultimate mission, which is serving students. The sense of community that's been established in Westside is a shared vision. As you know, an integral part of the site visit is to conduct interviews to gather information regarding the program and perceptions and experiences of all stakeholders. I would like to share with you just a few comments shared during the interview process regarding the impact that induction has had. So during the teacher candidate interviews, one commented, our mentors pour so much love and support into us, no matter what our needs are, they provide it. During the administrative candidate interviews, my eyes were opened wider in the scope of things. Being able to talk to a coach and get a more global view has helped me see the whole system. This program gave me ways to feel supported while on the job having the support while doing the job. And that's one of our ultimate goals for induction, right? Is that job embedded support to make our um, folks successful. And finally, a current mentor commented or mentioned, looking at how to support others as leaders has informed my induction program. It wasn't, has been informed by my induction program. I can give back what my mentor gave to me. So this is somebody who came up through the system of induction and is now a coach in the admin program. So overall, the team found that all standards for the administrative services induction and teacher induction programs were met, except for section A of the administrative induction standard four in in regards to the IIP, which was met with concern. 
And that's only that one little section. While the IIP is absolutely comprehensive and does make for a complete and robust experience, it does not clearly include all necessary components in one document to serve as a blueprint for the full experience. So it was all there, it just wasn't streamlined into one place. So the candidates and the coaches expressed um, you know, an inconsistent understanding of which document was truly the driving force of the induction experience and how they linked together. But again, that doesn't mean that the pieces weren't there. They, we, they definitely were. It's just, it wasn't as streamlined. So as a site visit team, we feel this is really an easy fix for the program. And as we talked to Dr. Rosal Bennett and her team, they were already in the process of working on strengthening and streamlining that process. So with that, we would like to recommend that West Side Union School District be fully accredited for both teacher induction and administrator induction as outlined in the report. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sisko. This is now an opportunity for institutional representatives to briefly comment about the report. We remind you it's not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather to provide any thoughts that you may have about the visit itself. I just want to thank, excuse me, thank you all for your time. We really appreciate you taking time to hear about our program today. We're very proud of the work being done in our district to support our new teachers and administrators. We enjoyed having the committee come and visit and provide us with that ever valuable feedback on our program. Throughout the next several months, we will be taking several steps to continue to improve our program and address the area that was met with concerns. These steps include convening focus groups for each program, to look at the paperwork used in the program and making necessary adjustments, working with the focus groups to look at provided examples of the CAS paperwork when making those revisions, and implementing that new paperwork beginning in the 23-24 school year. We will also be implementing a mid-year start date for our teacher induction program, allowing our candidates to start induction in both August or January, depending on the timing of the completion of their preliminary credential. Finally, we will continue to take into account feedback provided from our stakeholders and program candidates, as well as from our visit to continue to make adjustments to our program for continuous improvement. Again, we appreciate the valuable feedback provided by the committee, and we look forward to continuing to grow and develop the candidates in our program and in our district. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rosal Bennett. Any other member of the institution wish to offer a comment? All right. Any members of the COA have any comments or questions? All right, seeing none, this is an action item or motion. motion. Let me, let me check us. I move that we accept the recommendation for Westside Union School District's induction programs of accreditation. Okay. Thank you. So moved a second by Member Balatayo. Any further discussion? Staff, we please call the roll. Jomelaine Bolatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Kresha. Aye. Katrina Kachikowski. Aye. Charles Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right. Member, are the uh, motion passes unanimously? Congratulations. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rosal Bennett, Ms. Rosal, Mr. Hughes, Ms. Ms. Sisko, and thank you, Ms. Nahar Naharo. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so have much. A great day. Right, moving on to item 15. Item 15 is a report of the accreditation team to West Covina Unified School District. Consultant Gay Roby will introduce the item, and joining her is team lead Juliana Sykes and institutional representatives Patrick McKee, Direction of Induction, Foothill Consortium, Patty Fletcher, Office Manager. Dr. Emmy Flores, Superintendent, West Coast Vienna Unified School District. Michael Seaman, Assistant Superintendent of West Coast Vienna Unified School District. Matthew Ween, Interim Superintendent from Benita Unified School District. Kevin Ward, Assistant Superintendent, Claremont USD. Eric Osborne, Executive Director of Glendora Unified School District. Dr. Danny Kim, Assistant Superintendent, Charter Oak Unified School District. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Roby, please begin. Thank you. 
Good morning, com uh, committee members. It's nice to see you all, although Zoom. Uh, the site visit for West Covina Unified School District occurred way back in October on the 10th through the 12th, so it's a, a distant memory for those of us in accreditation, but I'm pleased to be here today. While West Covina USD is the lead educational agency, the program is known locally as the Foothill Induction Consortium, and the consortium has five member districts and Chair Frelly just read you through all the representatives who are here from that consortium, but they are West Covina Unified, Charter, Fo Charter Oak Unified, Claremont Unified, Bonita Unified, and Glendora Unified. In addition to those five, they have longstanding MOU with two other local districts that may be joining as uh, co consortium members soon. The consortium offers two induction programs, the Teacher Induction Program, or TIP, and the administrator induction, which we call CASC, the Clear Administrative Services Credential Program. They employ a full-time director, Patrick McKee, a full-time staff support member, and since our visit, they now have a part-time clerk as well. The site visit team was a four-member team with Stacy Tizer acting as team lead, common standards reviewer, and two program level reviews. Over the course of a three-day visit, the team interviewed 225 constituents from 14 representative groups. The review was held according to all COA protocols. There were no extenuating circumstances. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, team member Juliana Sykes, who will be joining us today in uh, place of our Stacy Tizer team lead, who we give a shout out recuperating today. Um, Juliana, I turn it over to you. There we go. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I will be sharing a little bit of the site report. The site visit team conducted a thorough review of the Foothill Consortium induction programs and confirmed that the preconditions were met. Um, we also found that the common standards were met along with the standards for the teacher induction program and the admin induction program. Um, and before I go into more of the report, I just want to acknowledge and thank Patrick McKee, who's the director of the Foothill uh, Consortium Induction Program. We just found him to be so personable, so on top of providing us with information and just really lovely to work with. We could see that his passion for developing educators really just sh shined uh, throughout the entire site visit. And we also want to acknowledge and, and thank the uh, members of the Foothill Consortium teams, as well as the West Covina Unified slash Foothill Consortium Advisory Board. Um, again, overall, our impression of the site visit was positive, and there are just a few aspects of the Foothill Consortium induction programs that really stood out to us as a site team. Again, the first one was that we found the program director, Patrick McKee, to be highly responsive to our needs um, and to the needs of the candidates in both the TIP program and the CASC program. A great example of this is just this robust professional development library that he's created. Um, during one of the, the interviews, um, one candidate said, you know, there was a, a PD that I was looking for. And within hours, uh, Patrick had provided, you know, this PD video and it was, it was ready and accessible for me. So it really evidences how responsive Patrick is and how responsive the programs are to the needs of the candidates. We were also really impressed with Patrick's collaborative nature. Um, as a regional leader, Patrick is someone who not only gives back to the school districts that he serves, um, as well as the professional networks that he's part of, but he was also one of the hosts of the California Induction Conference last year, and he presents PD within his own consortium. So again, it really just speaks to you know, his own investment and passion for developing educators. The team was really impressed with the way in which the program is gather and utilize data for continuous improvement. Um, just the detail of data that Patrick had available to us and the analysis provided um, really uh, situated the program within a cycle of continuous improvement. And it was very evident as we met with various um, uh, interview groups um, how data was being utilized. Um, and so again, overall, we just commend Patrick for the efficiency and thoroughness to which um, he responded to requests for additional information from the site team as we conducted our visit. And um, what we want to say is that overall, the team finds that the standards are met for both induction programs and recommends full accreditation. Um, and this is based on a thorough review of all institutional and programmatic information, as well as the materials that were available uh, both prior and during the accreditation site visit. 
And that's all the information I have to present out. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for the details. Appreciate it. Uh, this is now an opportunity for institutional representatives to briefly comment about the report. We remind you it's not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts that you have about the visit. Good morning. This is Patrick McKee, the director of the Foothill Consortium Induction Program. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Before I begin, I just want to take a quick opportunity to thank our site visit team for their support and collaboration during this process. First, to Gay Roby, thank you for your guidance over the past year to ensure this smooth and seamless visit. I value our monthly meetings as you helped us to reflect upon our systems and processes. Next to Stacey Tizer, Juliana Sykes, and the rest of our site visit team, I want to thank you for your role in making this a comfortable and meaningful visit for all of our constituents. We have had members of our program share how much they appreciated the time you took to get to know them and to get to know our program, the thoroughness of your review process, and for supporting everyone and reflecting upon the impact we're making on the educational community. As you see this morning, I'm joined by many members of our leadership team and here to also share a few thoughts. We have our chairperson, Kevin Ward, the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources for Claremont Unified, who would also like to share a few words. Good morning, everyone. And uh, committee members, thank you for your dedication and support to, um, to California students. Um, the CAST, which is the Assistant Superintendent team um, over the program, would really like me to communicate our support for Foothill Induction and appreciation to Patrick and his team for the tireless work and dedication to an out, it is an outstanding program. And I hope that really comes through in the port in the report that you got. And uh, we see it in action with our teachers and, and I can't express um, what a tremendous program it is. And you're right, Patrick is, is the key and, and has really built it um, in the past couple of years. So the accreditation process will really ensure us um, the program's excellence, uh, and our dedication to ensuring quality adults to serve the children of our five districts. Thank you all for your service and thank you for uh, letting us have this opportunity to meet with you today. And thank you, Kevin, so much for, for your leadership and to all of our leaders who are here today. What I appreciate most about this entire process is it really provided us with this opportunity to reflect on why we do what we do. We're proud of the program we provide and the support we provide, but this really gave us that opportunity to examine every system and every process in place to ensure we're making a positive difference in the lives of our candidates and the support of the students they serve. We reflected upon all elements of our program to make sure that we are they all embody our vision of implementing a collaborative, authentic, reflective, personalized, meaningful experience for our candidates. During the report, at the conclusion, Gay Roby spoke to the observable themes of our program, and these themes capture the spirit of our work, and our goal moving forward is to remain steadfast in aligning all we do to these themes and to our vision. We'll maintain our commitment to ensure each of our candidates have the support they need to serve the diverse students of our state. Thank you again to everyone involved with this process, and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Any member, uh, committee member, member Forbes. Well, congratulations on such an outstanding report and, and obviously excellent work that's going on. So my question really is only about the future. So if, um, I noticed that you had quite a number, uh, you had a very large increase between the number of program completers in table one and the number of candidates enrolled. And I'm hearing excellent um, information about what a dynamic leader you have. So in your thoughts about the scalability of your program, do you anticipate more growth? And if so, what are your thoughts or what have you learned so far in scaling up this wonderful program that has a dedicated leader. Uh, what, how are you look for the future in that regard if you have a lot more candidates? Thank you for your question. It's definitely something uh, specifically Kevin Ward and I speak about all the time. We always want to make sure that we are able to be sustainable. And what we have done as we move forward is um, any additional districts who reach out to us, we look at our ability to sustain. We've utilized roles like liaison roles to support us with our processes. And if we bring anyone on board, we're committing to ensuring their successful completion for two years. We, we need to make sure um, that we can be able to implement the same program that is stellar to everybody, no matter who joins us. And I appreciate our leadership team. That's how we uh, increased our staff this year to having an office clerk. Um, it was definitely noted. 
Uh, we have seen an influx just within our own member programs of hiring. So we continue to take a look at in increasing our, our support structures in place, but also not overworking anyone involved in the process. And we're really attuned to that along our journey. Thank you for those thoughts. I think they'll be useful to the to others in the field as well. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comment? All right, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion? Member Forbes. I move that we accept the recommendation of accreditation for West Covina Unified. Wait a minute. Sorry. West Covina mm -hmm. Unified School District Foothill right. Consortium. Thank you. So moved. Is there a second? Uh, member Cervantes, any further discussion? Will the staff please call the roll? Jomeline Bolatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Krasia? Aye. Katrina Chikowski? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Ellen Hellis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? All right. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Absolutely. So thank you, uh, Ms. Roby, for your report. Thank you, Ms. Sykes, uh, Superintendent Flores, and all the representatives of West Covina Unified School District. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, moving on to item, item 16 is the discussion of the six-month follow-up report from Point Loma Nazarene University. Consultant William Hattrick will introduce the item, and joining him are institutional representatives Dr. Deb Erickson, Dean, Dr. Jill Hamilton Bunch, Associate Dean, and Dr. Jennifer Critch, Director of Special Education. Anyone need to recuse himself? Seeing none, Mr. Hattrick, will you please begin? That's cool. Okay, it's reconnecting me, so I'll start. All right, and I'm presenting today for uh, Sarah Solari, who couldn't be here. Um, good morning, committee members. Um, if you will remember, Point Loma Nazarene University had an accreditation site visit in April of 2021 that resulted in a recommendation from the COA of accreditation with stipulations. Since that time, a revisit was held in March 2022, and Point Loma addressed the stipulations that were placed upon the institution. At the COA meeting, when the accreditation status was changed from accreditation with stipulations to accreditation, the committee asked Point Loma to report back with information specific to the adapted physical education program, specifically um, addressing standard 11 of the APE standards. Committee members wanted to know the results of modifications that were made to curriculum and field work, which provided candidate instruction in the principles of motor learning and motor control as they applied to the effective instruction of individuals with disabilities and the ways that candidates demonstrated their abilities of this specific knowledge through the coursework and field work. In the link provided, Point Loma included the specific assignments assigned to candidates and collected candidate work to show what candidates were offered uh, for instruction and demonstrated their knowledge, skills, and abilities related to this uh, specific competency. Point Loma has representatives here to answer any questions you may have about the submitted evidence. Thank you, Mr. Hattrick. Any, cons any member of the institution wish to offer any comment? Any committee member have any questions or comments you'd like to ask? All right, seeing none, I guess this is quick and easy one. Is there a motion? Member Balotayo. I move that we accept this report from Point Loma Nazarene. Thank you. Second by Mayor Tchaikovsky. Any further discussion? All right, would staff please call the roll? John Malayne Bilatayo? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Evan Taylor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. 
So congratulations. And some of you may know Deb Erickson was was on the board here. How many were here when Deb was with us? Anybody? Deb, you still got a few of us around. It's nice to see all of you. And thank you. Just one question. Um, I believe the report has already been amended to say that all, all standards are now met. I believe that's true. Is that correct? Um, it has not at the, this point, but we certainly could do that. This was an unusual one in that yes. the committee gave full accreditation at the, la the last time it came, but yet there was still one issue. So we will figure out a way to make that reflect. Thank <laughs> you very we'll much. For you. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thanks, Tip. So nice. again, thank you, Dr. Okay. Erickson, Dr. Hamilton Bunch, and Dr. Krish. And again, Mr. Hattrick, thanks so much. All right. Have a good day. Moving on to item 17, it's the discussion of the second quarterly report for La Sierra University. Consultant Miranda Gutierrez will introduce the item. Joining her virtually today are institutional representatives, Dr. Chang Ho Ji, Dean, Dr. Keith Dryberg, Department Chair, Dr. Dora Clark Pine, Department Chair and PPS Program Director, Dr. Raymond Hurst, Assistant Chair and Director of Assessment, Dr. Zizhuan Zhao, PBS School Psychology Program Co-Director, Professor Maria Kim, Multiple Subject and Single Subject Program Director, and Dr. Doug Herman, CTC Report Coordinator. Anyone need to recuse himself? Seeing none, Mr. Gutierrez, we please begin. Good morning. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank uh, Poonam Beatty, who presented for me at the October meeting, um, the very last minute. So thank you again for stepping in and doing that. As an update, this report presents the second quarterly report for La Sierra. As a reminder, they had their accreditation site visit in April 2022, and you all accepted the team's recommendation of accreditation with major stipulations, and part of the stipulations include providing quarterly reports. So this is the second quarterly report, and since the first quarterly report, La Sierra has continued to address each of the stipulations. They really centered around putting systems in place around the coordination within each program and the unit through the Office of Student Support Services and Records, which was created as a result of the site visit. This new office includes a systematic process for tracking candidates and monitoring the candidate progress. This office also collects advisement data on candidate uh, progress, and then it is shared with the new CTC Committee for Implementation and Improvement. Um, which is a new committee also based on as a result of the site visit. Um, the impl implementation committee reviews data they receive and they've been taking action based on what the data tells them. Data is also shared with their constituents and some next steps are next steps that we're working on with La Sierra showing um, making sure that that continu continuous improvement process is evidenced in, um, clearly for the site revisit in April. Um, so last year is also working on including feedback that they receive from their key constituents, especially employers. And I'd also just like to acknowledge that um, they've already begun addressing some of the comments made in the report. Um, once this report was posted and they submitted their report, we talked about things in it. And so they've already started working on um, some of the feedback there. So with that, I can go ahead and turn it over to Dean G to um, talk to you a little more about those actions. Thank you very much, Dr. Gutierrez. Um, as presented, uh, we are addressing all the stipulations and concerns pretty seriously. And then I do think that uh, we already started all the process for data collection. Uh, also, we digitalized most of our assessment process. So it's actually on time we review and collect and also newly established Office of Assessment and Data Management analyze on a regular basis and report to the department as well as the program directors. More importantly, we also established the, our school education committee for uh, implementation and improvement, which we get the regular report as well as monitor, you know, uh, those are progresses and also the changes that we make. So uh, I'm actually quite uh, optimistic in about uh, next site visit, we will have solid data as well as address all the stipulations. Thank you. Any other member of the institution wish to offer any comment? All 
All right, seeing none, hearing none, we'll go to the committee members. Any committee member have a question or comment? All right, seeing none, this is an action item. Staff, please call the roll. Oh, I'm starting to be a motion. I, I'm stunned that you're all so silent. It's a, I must have said something wrong. I, <laughs> Member Hillis. Like to make motion that we accept the second quarterly report from La Sierra University. Thank you so moved. Seconded by Member Tchaikovsky. Any further discussion? Now, will the staff please call the roll? Jomeline Bolatayo. Aye. Augustine Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Kresha. Aye. Katrina Tchaikovsky. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right, motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chang Ho Ji, and all the representatives from La Sierra University, as well as Ms. Gutierrez. Ms. Gutierrez, thank you all for your work. Appreciate it. Have a thank good you day. very much. We are back on schedule. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to Co Chair uh, Martinez, and so we'll take over from here. Thank you, Co Chair uh, Frawley. Moving on to item number 18 on our agenda. The report of the accreditation team to Pasadena Unified School District. Consultant Karen Sacramento will introduce this item. Joining her is Institutional Representative Sarah Ruchenko, Director of Human Resources, and Team Lead Dr. Melissa Meets Hall. Uh, does anyone need to recuse themselves? Okay, Ms. Sacramento, thanks for being with us. Will you begin, please? Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, good morning, CUI members. It was my pleasure to serve as the consultant to the Pasadena Unified School District virtual site visit, which was held on November 14th to 16th. The protocols for this visit were all in accordance with normal procedures for a site visit, along with those needed considerations for the virtual format. The findings were based on a thorough review of all institutional and program documents, as well as a wide range of constituent interviews. I would like to state that a correction was made to the report after the original posting, and that can be found on page three under the common standards paragraph with the corrected notation and the corrected information. Thank you to district representatives and program leadership, specifically Sarah Chinko and Hannah Lee for their work that was done in this regard and for working to support this visit. I would also like to acknowledge the extremely hard work and professionalism of the site visit team members, Elizabeth Heinberger and Gina Smith. And thank you too for the tremendous leadership of Dr. Melissa Metzhall as the team lead. Melissa led with grace and expertise every step of the way, including her support and guidance before the visit. And she carried this deep knowledge of both the uh, accreditation process and of the preconditions and standards throughout the visit. So I will now turn it over to Melissa to review the program findings. Oh, thanks, Karen, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's my honor to be here with you and to present the team's findings and the resultant, our recommendation for Pasadena Unified. Um, on behalf of the site visit team, I too would like to thank Pasadena Unified and Dr. Uh, Sarah Rachenko. Um, as the induction coordination for the, or coordinator for the program, she provided the review team, of course, with the resources and materials necessary to conduct the review. And of course, that included the accreditation website and access to materials and um, uh, coordinating of, of those interviews. And as Karen said, I would like to thank the site visit team uh, and remind us all, as many folks before me today in the agendas have, have said, the work begins long before the site visit. The site visit is a crucial part where we can further understand the experiences of candidates. And in, in this case, Pasadena, uh, they have a teacher induction program. So really listening carefully, um, as you know that we do, to the candidate's experience, in addition to looking at all of those um, uh, all of those materials. So you have um, quite a, a, a detailed and thorough written report, and I'm glad that um, we did catch that um, correction there at the top regarding the common standards. Uh, Karen, I do especially appreciate your support, um, just um, getting us organized, keeping us organized, and then um, as you'll hear, and, and you all know, it is so important for us to time and time and time again in our conversations, go back to the language of the standards. 
So we all know it's not about how we do something in our program or how we've seen it done. It is what do the standards call for. And that is where a lot of our conversation and a lot of the team's time come, comes in, as you, as you, you know. So a couple of um, contextual um, pieces, first regarding the district itself um, and the induction candidates, which it serves. The district is intentionally focused on the recruitment of teachers who represent a variety of backgrounds, representing both eth ethnic, socioeconomic, and cultural diversity. The district serves nearly 15,000, roughly their ADS 15,000, and the families that they serve speak um, up to 24. There's 24 different languages that are represented. Uh, the partnership for the residency program is a strength in, in um, recruiting and having uh, folks and the students be able to see teachers um, and themselves represented in their teachers. So um, the residency is, and I will talk about that in, in a minute, what, of how that makes sense and, and what sense it makes um, for, for Pasadena. Uh, secondly, I want to um, just talk a little bit about the um, ADS survey data. So the ADS survey data has the completer data. And you may have noticed that we called out in the report, I believe it was page seven, we called out the number of candidates. We can all check, yeah. So on page seven, uh, what we indicated was that there were fewer than 10 completers who completed that, that survey. Now, the reason we included that is because we, we interviewed seven completers. So if we think about 10 who were recommended for a credential, that percentage was, was pretty high. Um, we don't know um, when we look at the table and we look at the size of the program in the year that we visited, which is this was this past November, uh, we know that the program numbers were significantly smaller. So that's not an alarm. It's not a concern. It was just a piece of factual information that helped us when we were thinking about those, about those completers. Um, and then lastly, as far as the highlights, I just want to um, let you know that we did hear, again, going back to that candidate and that mentor experience. So you have a couple of different quotes of the perspective from the candidates. A candidate said they had great mentors and that the mentors were engaged in supporting their development. So at this point, I wanna move on to recommendations and um, I'm going to kind of group some of those stipulations and, and Talk about them that way, if you will. Certainly not going to read you read you all of those that are already in the report. So, after close examination of the program documentation and interviews, and making sense of those interviews, um, the team made a unanimous recommendation of accreditation with major stipulations. Uh, so, what I mean by that is all team members were involved in all conversations around pre, um, program standards and common standards. Um, that recommendation is based on the finding that Pasadena Unified School District had two, three, and five met with concerns and common standard one and four were not met. Uh, for the program standards, one and two were found to be met, program standard four was met with concerns, and program standard three, five, and six were not met. Um, again, tireless conversations to make sure, thinking also about that completer data, um, no statistical um, a significant variance in how candidates were reporting from Pasadena compared to the, to the state averages. Um, so I'm going to tie a few of these uh, stipulations and common standards together, and then I'm going to do uh, a bit of the same for program standard. So common standard one and four, uh, what we found is that there was an understanding by program leadership of the steps and the components which would have been included in a continuous improvement process. Okay, there were conversations about, we understand that there would be data, that we understand there would be conversations about collection of data and analysis of data and decisions based on data. That was not evident that it was, um, it was, um, was in place. So you can read in those um, rationale findings, there was no implement, um, evidence of that being implemented. Um, also called out in our report, there was no evidence that the relevant stakeholders were informed or, or part of that collaborative process mm -hmm. to enact the common standard requirements. Um, the team could confirm that instructional personnel collaborating the residency program 
That's why I brought that up earlier. Um, they do have that collaboration with the residency partners, but we did not have evidence uh, beyond that. So that's why that part was, I thought, important there. Um, then I'm going to move on to program standard three and five, which is ILP development, the use of the ILP, and monitoring. Um, and that is also connected to precondition four. So I know that you all have a lot of experience with um, accreditation, with your own programs. Um, you may not know teacher induction, as you know, some folks may know it more, more closely, and others may not be as, as familiar with it. So I, I want to um, really spend a moment and talk about the crucial component in teacher induction of an ILP. And if we think about um, the importance of the ILP, um, it, it's, it's not just the creation of the ILP, it's the use of the ILP. And it's, it's, it's how a candidate and their coach guides, guides the journey. So teacher induction, as you know, is individualized and job embedded. The therefore, the timely development of their ILP and revisiting the goals and the focus of their inquiries, that is the candidate's journey. So um, I heard some other folks use some different um, ways to kind of imagine this. I was kind of thinking about it, that ILP really is the compass or the roadmap for the candidate's journey. It's their curriculum and their field, um, field experience. So um, as you've read the report, you're going to see that the team's description of the implementation and the use of the ILP begins on page 10 and carries over quite, quite a bit onto, onto page 11. We really wanted you to be able to understand what, what was there and what was not, what was not taking, um, taking place. So um, the other facet of this was the team could not confirm the location for monitoring uh, the creation of the ILP goals, and that is connected to precondition. Um, so we know that um, the ILP is there. We know that folks are talking about those goals. The mentor is involved, site administrators. Uh, you know, Some could tell us how they were involved, but it just isn't serving that purpose as, as it's understood in the standards. Um, so I hope that what we've made clear is that connection to the specific language, again, the specific language um, of the standards, and then those stipulations directly connect to that. Um, it's my honor to serve, it always has been. Um, important facets, there's others, of course, that are included, but I think those are the, the key pieces that I wanted to bring uh, to you for, for this part of this report. So um, the more that we're part of the process, the better that we can be. You've heard that from other folks. Um, I think that um, you know, embracing that process and seeing how we can all contribute for all, I think that's that's at the heart of, of, of what we're about. So with that, I'll, I'll close out my portion and um, maybe you have questions and or you have um, Sarah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meatsall. Um, we now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the report. We remind you that this is not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather to provide any thoughts you had about the visits. And uh, Ms. Rachenko? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, good morning and thank you commission for letting me um, just take a few minutes. First of all, to thank both Karen Sacramento and um, Melissa Metz Hall. They were actually fabulous. I learned a lot through the process and um, you know, we're in agreement with the um, stipulations and the things that need to be completed in order to make our program strong. We have a lot of components in place or we have most of the components in place. It's just tying it to the standards and ensuring that everything is articulated. I wanted to just um, point out for precondition number four that was um, regarding the making sure that within the 60 day period of enrollment that the goals are developed. Um, we did already take corrective action on that notice and made sure that there was a procedure that was written out for our mentors to know as um, teachers come in. And then with what um, uh, Dr. Hall had mentioned, making sure that there was also the um, sort of follow through to know when that occurred and that there was a procedure in place for that to be submitted to the coordinator of the program to be sort of checked off that it was in fact completed within the 60 day period. So we did take care of that um, precondition as we know that that's critical as we hopefully um, will have the opportunity to work with both Karen and the commission and um, make sure that we get everything in line so that our 
program follows the standards. We serve over 75 teachers. Um, they, they do really love working with our mentor teachers and that part's really strong. We just need to put some of these pieces together so that we're in complete uh, compliance for accreditation. And we hope that you'll give us that opportunity to show you that we can get everything together and, and make sure that we in fact are in compliance um, with the standards and continue to offer this to our teachers. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rachenko. Um, I'm going to start off questions for committee members, um, and then I'll open it up to others. But um, so just a quick question, because there there was quite a few stipulations. Can you talk um, just generally about your initial, the district's initial plans to address, uh, you know, um, maybe a more, a more comprehensive ILP, but also um, some of the other key stipulations uh, that yeah. were recommended? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so definitely one of the things that came out is that we haven't had the involvement as many people as we need. Um, it's been a little more of a one man show, um, being myself and with other responsibilities. So critical to it is making sure we actually have a separate person as an induction coordinator. Um, so that's one thing we have somebody in mind that we're going to be moving forward with. Um, with this work and just already I've um, assigned this person, uh, well, the person that's not here today, she has another engagement, but Hannah Lee, who worked on our program, I've already, she's been sort of relieved of some of her other duties um, with a different person so that she can help with the accreditation process until we have the position. So one, we recognize the need for a teacher induction coordinator uh, for the program. We've also already started some of the um, stakeholder engagement um, and corrective action, we did make a whole list of some of our corrective actions that we need to take as we sort of systematically go through, um, you know, each of the standards and um, refining our program and just making sure that it has the evidence. We feel like some of it's there, um, you know, maybe post pandemic, just some things got loose as far as just ensuring that we had the evidence that was required um, for the program, even though we were doing some of the things. So I think that's where we fell, we fell short. Um, so one, just ensuring that we have the evidence and ensuring that we have the data, um, the necessary data. We have data, but we have to make sure that the data we have is what is actually needed and reflected in the standards. I don't know if Thank that fully much. answered. I mean, I can keep talking about all the corrective things, but I think that's the the general gist. It did. Thank you very much. How about mm -hmm. other questions or comments from other committee members? Member Morrison and then Member Forbes. Hi, uh, this might just be a, a typo. Or I, might, I might just be missing something, but uh, in your um, reports where you have the people that you interviewed, uh, the mentors that were interviewed is zero, which, uh, which struck me. But then in reading the reports, uh, there are quotations from uh, several mentors uh, within the report, so is that just a um, is that just a mistake, or, or are the quotations from different people? Oh, thank you. No, that's oh, certainly. Oh, thank you, Karen. Go, go ahead, Dr. Metzal. I was just going to affirm it is certainly a mistake, but go ahead, Karen. Yeah, ditto. Yeah, that that isn't uh, that needs to be corrected. I apologize for that. There were a number of in, uh, I'm number of mentor interviews um, and mentors interviewed throughout. So I apologize for that. Member Forbes. Thank you. And, and thank you um, for addressing the things that you're already considering doing. So I can see that additional resources are going to be allocated in order to have this additional personnel that's going to help support the program, which gets to the question of infrastructure, because if a program relies only on a leader, no matter how charismatic or efficient, then if that leader is not there, the program is, um, you know, certainly going to have much more difficulty being sustainable. So, and you, you also mentioned that there's a lot of data that you're already collecting and that you're going to make sure that that data is what is needed. So my question really has to do on what your thoughts are about how you'll beef up or improve the um, comprehensive continuous assessment process. So it's one thing to collect the data, but then what happens to it? So what are some of your thoughts about how you will go about um, uh, working on that particular recommendation? Yeah, just off the top of my head, I think one of the key um, components that we did not have in place where the stakeholder and that committee, the committee with the different partners, with it, whether it's our professional development partners, 
um, the principals or site leadership and, uh, and the mentor teachers and, and our community people that we work with. So having that stakeholder committee together that that is their job to do is to look at the data that we collect, meet on a regular basis. So not just once or twice a year, but meeting on a regular basis, whether it's monthly or, or you know, every other month to um, sort of come together as a team okay, determine what's what's happening and then provide feedback to the induction coordinator to say, hey, this is what we're seeing, you know, where we need to have improvements and, and kind of then making adjustments as needed to um, the program to make sure we're meeting the needs of the standards. Thank you. So we did, um, just one last thing, we did identify the people that we have in that stakeholder group. Um, so that has been identified as we move forward. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you for, oh, go ahead, um, Member Tchaikovsky, sorry. So, super, super quickly, um, as was mentioned um, with previous uh, groups who came here this morning, um, attending the induction conference might be a good plan because there's a lot of examples about how this could look, you know, what Member Forbes is describing. Um, this is a great kind of shopping opportunity to look at artifacts. Um, the ILP obviously was discussed multiple times. There's a lot of different ways the ILP can look. So I think that that might be a good plan. And then if you find if you find colleagues there with whom you relate, then they can become your critical friends. And then you can see their um, websites that they posted. That might just save a lot of time, you know, because there are programs that offer things as templates that will be uh, just make your life easier, given that you're just formalizing and putting things together. So I'd suggest that. Thank you, Member Tchaikovsky. May I respond? Please. Oh, I wanted to say thank you. I totally agree. And thankfully, we are part of cluster four. And we have a strong cluster that works together. And as you stated, um, I definitely you look, talking to our colleagues and seeing what they're doing and their best practices. Um, I was sitting in the meeting and I heard West Covina. I know some of those people. So thank you. I agree. And, and sending, making sure that uh, are meant not just um, myself, but the mentors and some of the other people involved attend the conference. Excellent. Thank you. This is an action item. Do I have a motion uh, by a committee member? Member Tchaikovsky. So <clears throat> I move that that we accept the report for Pasadena Unified School District um, with a recommendation of accreditation with major stipulations. A second. Member Bolotayo. Uh, well, we will now do a roll call. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Jomaline Bolotayo. Aye. Augustin Cervantes. Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Katrina Chikowski. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Alan Hallam. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Three. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Can I add one thing oh, to this? please. So because one of the issues was related to a precondition and we the handbook actually requires the preconditions to be addressed much sooner. And it sounds like they've already addressed it. So I think we'll, if we could just get the documentation for that, and then we could bring it back at the very next meeting, if we can, and then you could remove that stipul that particular stipulation next yeah. time. If that Thank works. you, Cheryl. We have a meeting set up uh, next week. So um, I'll, we'll address that next week, um, Pastina, Steph, and I, and then we'll bring that forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mitzal, Ms. Sacramento, and Ms. Ruchenko. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number 19. It's a report of actions taken to address stipulations from University of Southern California. Consultants Jake Schuler and Miranda Gutierrez will introduce this item. Joining them today are institutional representatives Scott Linus, data project specialist, Dr. Marie DeComas, Program Administrator, Dr. Kathy Crescia, Director of Accreditation, Dr. Jamara Mateo Gaxiola, Director of Community Engagement, Dr. Kathy Stowe, Associate Dean of Academics Programs, Dr. Darlene Robles, Associate Dean of Equity and Community Engagement, and Kate O'Connor, Assistant Dean of Professional De Development. And does anybody need to recuse themselves? A member of Bolotayo will recuse. And, and Member Crescia. 
and we still have a quorum. Okay. Ms. Gutierrez, will you begin, please? Good morning. Um, again, before I get started, I'd just like to thank Jake for um, taking the lead on this in October when I wasn't able to make it at the last minute. So this item presents the fourth quarterly report for USC. At their accreditation site visit in October 2021, the team recommended accreditation with stipulations, which this committee accepted, and part of those stipulations were providing quarterly reports. So the stipulations related to concerns at the unit level and within the common standards include a theme of including all programs in a comprehensive system and inclusion in decision making at the unit level. It also includes looking for um, that the unit takes feedback from all programs and constituents. Um, activities to support these stipulations include the Dean's Executive Council, and part of the Dean's Executive Council includes associate deans who represent each of the credential programs at these meetings. And one of the newest actions taken in this report is the creation of the USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group, which does include a representative from each credential program. And this group was created with a few purposes. Um, to, create, commu to communicate feedback and support needed to the Dean's Executive Council, to include all programs in the unit's continuous improvement and assessment process, and to provide the credentialing office with the resources and capacity to advise candidates in all programs and um, to create efficiency in completing the credential recommendation process. Um, this new group is newly created and they held their first meeting in January 2023. And we do have representatives from the institution who can speak more about this newly formed group and how they will support the unit's operations. Another area of stipulations um, related to credentialing is, was the capacity and their ability to advise candidates in all programs. And so as of December, 2022, the credentialing, credentialing office is fully staffed and um, they will be monitored and supported through this new USC K-12 uh, credential candidate support group. And finally, there's a stipulation related to um, a candidate centered process to identify barrier, barriers to entry and retention into the profession of candidates from diverse backgrounds. And in the past reports, USC reported information about the Dean's Charge. And the Dean's Charge includes a quality of programs initiative where each program defines its equity lens and how it affects admissions. And additionally, through retention and time to, deg time to degree, each program will need to show that they are approving this through their equity lens. And each program addresses this in their own way and their progress is reported out through the Dean's Charge. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jake, who will speak more about the stipulation that were related to the preliminary administrative services program. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Still morning for a few more minutes here. Uh, good to see you all in person. Um, the stipulation specific to the preliminary administrative services credential program, uh, we're focused on ensuring consistent practices in the following areas. Um, first, gathering and using input from relevant constituents, such as advisory boards, faculty, supervisors, and candidates. Second, ensuring that all candidates experience diverse school settings during field work placements. Third, consistently gathering robust data about candidate field work experience. And lastly, providing candidates with timely feedback on their progress in meeting all program requirements. Throughout the past year, as you can see in uh, the full report from USC, uh, program and unit leadership have provided evidence of strong practices in each of the areas uh, within the preliminary administrative services program. In addition, their report highlights an increased focus on one-to-one -on -one check-ins with candidates um, throughout the year to ensure that individualized supports are in place. Uh, this concludes our staff summary of the actions taken by USC over the past year to address each stipulation. As stated in the item, staff recommends that the COA review USC's fourth quarterly report, uh, the actions taken to date, and consider whether stipulations shall be lifted and, and USC's accreditation status from October 2021 be modified. Um, as, as you can see on Zoom, yes, um, USC leadership, uh, there's, a, there's a team here from USC who are on Zoom with us today, prepared to make additional comments on some key areas of the report. 
and Miranda and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Microphone was off. Uh, we now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment um, about the report or about um, next steps. Good morning. Good Go morning. ahead, Scott. Good morning. My name is Scott Linus, and I'm the project specialist for data analysis, working with the Office of Accreditation and Credentialing. I assist with survey development and implementation, qualitative and quantitative statistical analyses, and report generation, including visualization of the data. I have worked at Russier School of Education for about 10 years and have assisted with the last two cycles of accreditation, both federally and with the state of California. All of our programs at Russier, including social work and other programs, can come to our office for their analysis needs. I assist them with these endeavors and know from personal experience that these programs are on board with the accreditation office for ongoing program improvement efforts. For example, I'm currently analyzing three cycles of data from the MAT, SS, MS, and TESOL programs concerning faculty feedback about guiding teachers, candidate feedback about guiding teachers, and guiding teacher feedback about the candidates. I am also analyzing data from school counseling concerning verification of site supervisor training, a school counseling alumni survey, and counseling evaluations of the candidates by site supervisors. We are grateful to the Committee on Accreditation and Jake and Miranda for their guidance. Our latest fourth quarterly report addresses eight stipulations. Further clarification was requested for stipulations two, four, and seven. Regarding stipulation two, more details were requested for the unit-wide USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group. The members of this group, which are listed in the final fourth quarterly report, include representatives from all of the USC K-12 California licensure programs and the coordinator, who is the Director of Accreditation and Credentialing. The members have already met on January 5th, 2023, and another meeting is being scheduled for February. In the February meeting, time will be devoted to setting up a consistent meeting date for each month going forward. Feedback from the programs to the program representatives in the group will be discussed. The Director of Accreditation will also have the opportunity to share accreditation information with the group. The Director of Accreditation then meets one-on-one -on, -one on a monthly basis with an Executive Council member the Associate Dean of Academic Programs, who in turn can bring issues to the Executive Council, which includes the Dean. Regarding Stipulation 4, an update on the coordination and leadership transition with the School of Social Work was asked for. The School of Social Work at present is under the leadership of an interim Dean, Vasilios Papadopoulos, who will remain in that position for the foreseeable future. Steve Hyden, representing the School Counseling Credential Program out of the School of Social Work, reports that the PPSC program is running well. Updates regarding the coordination and leadership transition at the School of Social Work will be made by Steve Hyden to the USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group. Resources necessary and steps to address needs of the School of Social Work will be addressed on an ongoing monthly basis with the USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group. Finally, regarding Stipulation 7, information was requested from USC leadership concerning the continued onboarding and sustainability of the unit-wide advisory group. In other words, the USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group. Our Executive Council USC leadership will now talk about that. Thank you. I'm also going to uh, bring in um, Dr. Darlene Robles, who is also a member of Executive Council and is uh, can can speak to this as well. Um, 
I, I just wanted to reiterate that it is our priority, um, Rossier leadership's priority uh, to support all California licensure programs at USC. Um, we're committed to that process and we uh, continue to work on ways of improving communication. Um, issues come up from uh, the director of credentialing and accreditation um, by way of our uh, regular meetings. And then I bring up issues at executive council where we have associate deans of faculty affairs, uh, associate dean of research, associate dean of community engagement and professional development. We also have uh, assistant deans in other areas as well, budget, finance, uh, recruitment and enrollment and uh, advancement, as well as uh, two faculty council chair uh, members. So, uh, you know, as a member of the Dean's Executive Council, I want to assure you that all USC K-12 licensure programs are supported by the Accreditation and Credentialing Office um, and the coordinator of the USC K-12 Credential Candidate Support Group um, is the Director of Accreditation and Credentialing and that uh, director reports directly to me. Um, and so, you know, any, anything else, uh, you need from me, I'm happy to answer, but I would also just give an opportunity for, uh, Dr. Robles to chime in about our role in executive council and how we work with the different, um, stakeholder groups. If there are any questions of my colleague, Dr. Stowe, I will say a few words. I uh, want to call your attention to a reorganization that happened under Dino Guerra's leadership. Prior to uh, July 1, 21, I was a faculty advisor for this program. I wasn't directly responsible for those that were hired and um, working specifically on the preliminary credential. I was a faculty advisor in many areas. And... Uh, on July 1, the dean appointed me as associate dean of equity and community engagement. And under that uh, umbrella, professional development is in my unit. Since then, right at the accreditation time, we did a reorganization of positions. And I hired uh, Dr. Xiomara Mateo Caxiola, who is my director of community engagement. And also last uh, uh, early summer, we hired Dr. Uh, Maria de Kumas. Both come with extensive experience in schools uh, and leadership in schools. And with that, I think we have, and again, building on what Dr. Well, with uh, Kate O'Connor, have built a strong team who are totally committed uh, to ensuring that our program meets uh, and exceeds uh, the requirements under CTC. So I think that's a demonstration of our dean's leadership in making sure that he gave me responsibility uh, for ensuring that we meet all the accreditation standards. Uh, so now there are not only Dr. Stowe as an EC member, but myself with that responsibility who have a, a, a consistent communication with the EC and our Dean. Uh, both Dr. Stowe and I meet on a regular basis on one-on-one -on -one meetings and as necessary, we'll come together uh, to meet with him if there are issues of concern. But again, just the commitment that our Dean has made to fully staff uh, the credentialing department. So I think those are just uh, some evidence, uh, some points of evidence of, of our commitment to ensuring we have a quality program for our candidates. And again, uh, Dr. Dukumus and Dr. Mateo Gaxiola and Ms. O'Connor are welcome to add uh, what they're also doing, if you don't mind, uh, and to making sure that they, in their new positions and their uh, responsibilities, uh, meet all of the requirements of our accreditation. Well, as Jake mentioned earlier, you know, I, I can speak to stipulation eight. We've done a lot of work in um, making sure that we meet the stipulations. And a lot of that involves looking at the data from 
um, our program completers, from our current cohort of candidates. You know, we've been looking at um, not just the key assessment data and the competency records, but we've uh, uh, conducted focus groups. Um, I've been doing one-to-one -one check ins with candidates. We've been working with our site supervisors. And so we're really um, taking the feedback from all the members that are part of, you know, um, achieving the um, credential recommendation. And we're using it to improve our program. And so, as mentioned in the report, you can see just all the different things that we have. Um, are, that we are doing and we're continuing to do even more and even better. And so um, I just want to say thank you for um, your support as we um, work towards meeting these stipulations. Thank you, Dr. Dacumos. Um, Dr. Mateo Gaxiola. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to um, echo Dr. Dacumos' uh, sentiment of gratitude and thanks to uh, the accreditation team, Jake and Miranda, for their guidance and their support in this process, to our Director of Accreditation at USC Razier, um, and to the entire team for um, all of their efforts um, to um, answering the to the stipulations. Um, I think you'll see in our quarter four report that we have been quite diligent and focused on improving our programs, improving our coordination, and providing our candidates with um, the best uh, high quality learning experience that we possibly can. Um, so I just want to give uh, uh, everyone uh, that supported us in that process um, uh, an expression of gratitude and thanks, um, and just welcome any questions um, moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. How about comments or questions from committee members? Uh, Member Morrison. Uh, uh, this is a procedural question, uh, maybe, maybe to staff. Uh, in the uh, staff recommendations, um, staff often recommend to the committee whether stipulations should be lifted or not. And uh, there's no recommendation either way here. It just says we should discuss it. Yeah, I think that is our decision is to decide whether stipulations will be lifted. Um, and so I think through our questions um, that you have um, about the report, um, the feedback we've received from the institution, um, we can make that decision. I appreciate that, but there's usually a recommendation. Right, and there isn't one this time, and so that's our work. Um, uh, oh, I, don't, oh, I don't know if, it, if, it's, if you guys want to add any more, but I think... Uh, yeah, so, so oh, go ahead. Uh, and I actually have a couple of questions that maybe will help us then make that decision, if you guys are okay if we move forward with that. Sure. I was, I was just going to say, I, if I understand correctly, uh, the staff at this point is not weighing one side or the other, but they're inviting us as the COA members to go ahead and ask questions and get deliberate and then some, come to some decision. Yeah. So um, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanted to just kind of um, uh, follow up with what Dr. Darlene Robles mentioned earlier about staffing and reorganization. Uh, I, you know, I noticed that uh, it was one of the stipulations that you brought up about onboarding and and um, fully staffing in our credentialing and and uh, field work, all of the staff areas. And I just wanted to emphasize that that is an ongoing priority for us that we support. Uh, the different teams by way of uh, having great adding new staff members to meet the needs of our students, as well as, you know, expand on our capacity so that um, we do everything we can uh, to ensure a great onboarding and retention and training um, to increase the student experiences that uh, our students have. Um, I think we've been really responsive concerning the additional staff needs that we have. Um, since the visit, I believe we were able to hire uh, 
an additional credential analyst. Uh, we have new academic counselors, and uh, we also have an additional uh, field work coordinator. So right now we're fully staffed um, with great staff members, and uh, they're really uh, tending their focus on uh, enhancing our student experiences at ross -Sier. So, Thank you, Dr. Stowe. Um, so one, I'd like to start off the questions and uh, hopefully other members will have, or maybe other members will have uh, questions. So one of the things as I read through the report is that I noticed that um, like the new, I think it's the K-12 credentialing group is really brand new. Um, January 5th was just about two weeks ago. What's the plan to ensure like uh, systematization of that, of the, you know, the really the consistency of, of, of this work going forward? Because um, to me, that was um, something that really stood out that it, you know, that in the fourth quarter, it's just, just beginning to be implemented. So I can speak to that as the coordinator of that group. So how that came about is it's a more, it's a definitely formalized um, way of communication and ensuring accountability on all fronts. So, you know, in the past, we have met one-on-one -on -one with each one of the programs on a consistent basis, which you kind of saw through the links to those various meetings um, in the various program reports from quarter one to quarter three. And, you know, what's coming in the future is we seem to be expanding in terms of different types of programs that are outside of the School of Rossier. And so we saw the need to try to formalize that and to create a space where it was all about the credential programs, all about the K-12 K programs. So in order to really you know, facilitate that, I created a, you know, a space and a group where all representatives. So you know, we have representatives from Keck School of Medicine because we have our speech and language pathology group. The first group is gonna be graduating in the spring. And of course, School of Social Work, um, just really formalizing all of that coordination and all of that support, and also to ensure that we can really fully support how the data is collected and surveying and Scott and our staff really support all the programs. And so we just wanted to make sure that that was really obvious and it's going to be sustained and it's going to be going forth, you know, forever <laughs> um, in terms of, so, you know, we are definitely sustaining it. Um, it is definitely something that will be an absolute part of our accreditation process and program improvement efforts, because we will be looking at some of the common threads for all the standards going forward within all of the K-12 programs. And I'll just add that although the first meeting happened in, in January, it wasn't something that we drummed up. It was, uh, Kathy and I talked about this and we've had multiple conversations and uh, I just want to assure you that we are committed to moving this group forward because we see the need for collaboration and it's also efficient in that we're not having, you know, Kathy meet with different stakeholders at different times. Um, we really can share ideas and, and collaborate. So I think that that being the purpose and, and the outcome that we want we see a, a huge, it's a big strength for us and we wanna to continue to support that across the board. And just to add, I, I'm actually gonna kind of give kudos to the site visit <laughs> and the team for this, you know, this little germ of an idea that happened way back in October. Um, what I kind of learned during that process in preparing for accreditation, where we did bring in people, you know, from everywhere to talk about the accreditation process and the site visit and how things were coordinating is there was a lot of collaboration with the K-12 credentialing programs um, in that they had never really been able to talk to each other at the same time in the same space. And there's a lot of great sharing of ideas and um, a lot of sharing of great positive program improvement ideas and best practices. And so kind of coming out of that, I wanted to make sure that we could create that space and sustain it going forward because I think it's a critical part of accreditation and program improvement and support to the candidates. If I just Thank make, you, I think, excuse me, Mr. Ortiz, I, I apologize, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, oh, thank you. We, need, we do need clarify. to move forward with committee questions. Okay, thank you. I just wanna clarify, when we talk about K-12 preliminary administrative credential, that's one program. 
this new group is taking all of the programs that require credential program. So it's not just focus on K-12 preliminary credential, where, where your stipulations have the focus and we've addressed those. And again, I want to thank the Jake and Miranda and others who have supported us in this journey. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that's the understanding for the, the committee members, that it's not just K-12, it's all the credential programs that we have at Rossier that meet on a regular basis. We did it in the past, but very uh, not systematic. We, you know, we brought this group together and that group together and that group together. We said, well, you know, we're, we're having the same conversation. Let's bring everybody together. So, for example, in my office is the reading authorization credential and the preliminary credential. So I have Dr. Takumas and also uh, Dr. Racinus. And even though they're in the same office, now those two are invited to the broader group to have that input. So just want to make that clarification. Thank you. Appreciate that. How about questions or comments from committee members? Okay, we're, um, this is an action item and we need to decide um, if, if stipulations will be lifted. So um, need a motion. Member Morrison. I move that we accept the um, fourth quarterly reports from the University of Southern California and change uh, accreditation with stipulations to accreditation. Do I have a second? Member Taylor. Okay, uh, roll call please. Augustin Cervantes. Aye. Katrina Chagoski. Aye. Charles Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Ellen Hallis. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Okay. A uh, motion is carried. And I'd like to just thank uh, all the representatives from USC, uh, Ms. Gutierrez, Mr. Schuler, and, uh, and everyone else. If I missed anybody, thank you. Okay, and that moves us then to item 20. It's reported the accreditation team to California State University San Marcos. And Administrator Dr. Cara Mendoza will introduce this item. She is joined by team lead Mimi Miller and institutional representatives Lori Stoll, Director, School of Education, and Josie Robledo, Associate Director, School of Education. Uh, Dr. Mendoza, will you begin, please? Good afternoon. <laughs> And that's Jody Robledo. I think I heard Josie, whichever. Um, and we're going to make this quick because our team lead, Mimi, has to leave for a 1230 class in person. So she's very excited. So it's with great pleasure I'm here today with you, Mimi Miller, our team lead and consultant, Francis Keller, who shadowed this visit to share with you the report from California State University San Marcos virtual accreditation site visit, which was held on November 6th through the 9th last fall. I can confirm that the protocols for this virtual site visit were all in accordance with normal pro procedures relative to all of our accreditation visits, and that the team findings in this report are based on a thorough review of available and relevant institutional and program documents, as well as a wide range of interviews. The accreditation team at this visit conducted 531 interviews with various constituency groups associated with the educator preparation programs at CSU San Marcos. I believe this, that that strong turnout can be attributed to the exceptional and dedicated leadership of the CSU San Marcos team who are here with us today, Lori Stoll, Director of School of Education, and Jody Robledo, Associate Director, School of Education. I had the extreme pleasure of working for a full year with Lori and Jody, and I saw firsthand their commitment to the accreditation process, to their candidates, and to their education community. Their care, concern, and organization are without compare. Under their leadership, CSU San Marcos educator preparation programs continue to be responsive to their education community needs. By example, in October 2021, CSU San Marcos was approved by the Commission for a Pupil Personnel Child Welfare and Attendance and School Social Work Credential. And that particular program was just getting started during our um, visit. And it was in direct response to their community who said, you know, we need some support around increasing our social and emotional services to our kiddos in K-12 edu education. Um, and uh, leadership at CSU San Marcos continues to be essential partners in the Southern California Professional Development Federation. 
And um, over 20 years, they have been um, working with this group in an effort to really make sure that their area is strong and vibrant and uh, meeting the needs of the education community. I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and extreme professional of professionalism of our site team members, Ann Weisenberg, Barbara Howard, Nicole Walsh, Beth Hara, Joanne Iskin, Christine Ibarra, Muriel Enhood, and Paul Brazell. We all had a lot of life going on during this site visit, and they all just stepped up so well and just worked very hard. And of course, Mimi Miller. Where would we be without Mimi? So I'm going to shut up pretty soon <laughs> and say uh, we appreciated Mimi's leadership and guidance. And um, I think you see before you a robust report of a robust visit. And um, I think this committee can be very confident of our findings. With this, I pass it over to our friend Mimi, who will review the accreditation team findings. Thank you, Kara. Um, on behalf of the site visit team, I want to thank Kara Mendoza for her support during the whole process. Um, a big thank you also, uh, as um, Kara said, to uh, Lori and Jody and the whole accreditation unit leadership team at CSU San Marcos for designing the virtual site visit that allowed our team to meet with, meet with a wide range of constituencies. As we all know, that's, that's kind of a tough thing to do on Zoom, but it, but it did happen. It did happen. Um, I'd also like to express gratitude uh, to the site visit team for their hard work and professionalism, uh, truly a dream team, which is what we've called them, um, and their attention to detail is seen in the report in front of you today. Um, before summarizing the findings for program and common standards, I'd first like to report that at the, uh, at the virtual site visit, the accreditation team heard consistent positive remarks um, regarding the high quality of professional preparation in educator preparation programs at CSU San Marcos. And here are just some of the comments, and you can see more in the report. Employers of educators who were prepared at CSU San Marcos described them as having a real sense of social justice, equity, school reform, along with an inclusive mindset and knowledge of best practices. Many educators prepared at uh, CSU San Marcos, according to principals and employers, have become leaders at their school sites. Candidates who complete the programs describe their experiences as meaningful, rigorous, engaging. Even after they leave the preparation programs, there continues to be value in what they've learned. Evidence that the team collected also showed that the educator preparation programs um, at San Marcos have created strong, really strong, mutually beneficial partnerships with their public school partners, which in turn positively impacts education um, in the region for students and teachers alike. So now to summarize the findings on program standards and common standards, um, the team obtained sufficient and consistent information that led us to a high degree of confidence in making overall and programmatic judgments about the education unit. All program standards were found to be fully met for all programs. All common standards were found to be fully met for all programs. And on the basis of these findings and evidence described in the report, the, tree, the team recommends accreditation. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you have enough time to get to class. We appreciate you staying on and, and, and being here. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be this, here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, at this time, we invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the report Remind you, this is not a time to dispute the team's report, although I doubt you're going to be disputing anything, uh, but rather to provide any thoughts you had about the visit. So I'll turn it over to um, to Ms. Stoll or Ms. Robledo. I apologize for calling you Josie earlier. Thank you. We're happy to be here. I just want to say we were so very lucky to have Kara as our CTC liaison, and I want to thank her for all her support. It's good to see her again today. And we're appreciative of our experience with the team. They were wonderful. Um, it was a really excellent experience for all of us. We learned a lot through the process and it's been very helpful to us in our continuous improvement. So we appreciate the remarks and the report and all of their hard work. Ms. Robledo, did you want to offer anything? Not, not echo necessary. With, <laughs> I echo what Dr. Stoll said. I do. I just want to say a thank you to both Kara and Mimi for supporting us and leading an excellent team. And um, we, it was a great experience. We learned a lot and we were able to share our story. 
and we appreciate so much their attention to detail and their professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, are there any questions or comments from committee members? Okay, this is an action item. Do I have a motion? Member Volatile? Um, <clears throat> um, I propose that we accept this recommendation of accreditation for California State University, San Marcos. And do I have a second? Uh, Member Cervantes? Uh, we'll now do a roll call. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Jamaline Volatile? Aye. Augustine Cervantes? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Katrina Chakowski? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Paul Bailey? Aye. Alan Hallis? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Ernie Martinez? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, congratulations and uh, thanks for the great report. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stoll, Ms. Robledo, Ms. Miller, and Dr. Mendoza. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Members of the committee, it's been a long morning. <laughs> and, uh, so we are going to take a break for lunch now. Um, we'll come back at 1.15 and, um, and uh, move on to item number 21. Things were held in May and the most recent one on November 16th. We're proud to say that during each of the meetings, the advisory team reviewed program data, including mid-year, end-of-the-year candidate surveys and the state completer surveys, and the team has reported a high level of positive feedback from the program, from all of those data points during all of those meetings so far. But in, in addition to some positive feedback, the advisory team has also made recommendations for program improvement. Uh, during the November 16th meeting, a suggestion was made that diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, be a program focus moving forward. So for next steps, our PNTP team will look for ways to address DEI within our program. We'll continue to gather feedback from candidates and administrators using surveys, and we'll, we'll include questions regarding DEI in those surveys. Data from these surveys will be analyzed during the upcoming advisory team meetings, and we'll continue to monitor that progress and the feedback from our key stakeholders. Our second topic on our report was the system of support for our ed specialist candidates. Um, as I mentioned, we were excited to hire our new ed specialist coach. Um, we began the onboarding process in the spring of 2022, and that included training, job shadowing, um, attending coach forums to help prepare her for the position. This last August, the district hired 14 new ed specialist teachers, and each one is being supported by our ed specialist coach. Five of the 14 teachers have preliminary credentials and are participating fully in induction, and the remaining are on intern credentials or short-term permits. And a few of these teachers, we've also increased and um, added another layer of individualized support on a case-by-case -case basis that come from our ed specialist mentors or itinerant ed specialist staff, and they collaborate with our ed specialist coach. In addition, our new Ed Specialist website, which was designed by our PNTP coach, Sarah Landis, and in collaboration with our special education department, also continues to be a source of support for all of our special ed and gen ed teachers, as well as paraeducators and families. Our Ed Specialist coach attends the Department of Special Ed meetings that are held each week and reports back to our PNTP coaching team. For next steps on this issue, we'll continue to work closely with the Department of Special Ed, site administrators, and other staff to identify needs and coordinate specialized support for our ed specialist candidates. For example, our director and assistant director of special education in our district are members of our PNTP advisory team meeting uh, team, and they'll be attending the meeting in, on February 16th. Um, in addition, we're going to continue to gather feedback from our candidates and administrators through our program surveys and individual meetings with them, and we'll continue to take a look at that data with our advisory team to monitor progress. The third and final portion of our report is the May 2022 colloquium outcome and subsequent plans. Um, I do want to share that our Pleasanton Induction Program has hosted an annual colloquium for many years. 
But the format of the colloquium has evolved, um, and that's based on program feedback. The annual PNTP colloquium now encompasses year-end processes that are grounded in the concept of reflecting on and sharing key learnings over the year. The year-end colloquium activities include individual reflection, small group sharing during a colloquium advisory team meeting, and classroom recognition celebrations. Last spring of 2022, the coaches in PNTP supported all candidates in a year-end review of their ILP, or Individual Learning Plan Goals, which are based on the California standards of the teaching profession and the continuum of teacher practice. They noted successes, challenges, and next steps. Next, our candidates individually completed a year-end overview document to reflect on their professional growth, and which is connected to their goals and cycles of inquiry and induction. On May 12th, candidates attended a colloquium meeting along with our PNTP advisory team members. And during this meeting, the candidates shared their year-end overview, key learnings from their ILP, and experience in the induction program. The advisory team members listened to the candidates, they shared feedback, and they recorded data on a Google form to record the candidates' CSTP focus areas. After the, the colloquium meeting, our PNTP leadership team met to review each of the candidates' ILP documents as part of the IL, ILP review process. And then finally, a culminating part of our year-end colloquium activities has been classroom recognitions for all our year two candidates. Over the years, the program feedback has shown that this process of recognizing candidates for completing induction in their own classrooms with students and administrators present has been a positive and valuable experience. Last year's classroom recognitions were held during the week of May 23rd, and school site administrators were invited. Coaches presented a certificate of completion to each teacher, and they invited students and administrators to share comments and appreciations about them. We also captured comments on a celebration slide deck and added that along with the candidate photos. And this slide deck is shared with our school board and our district community to celebrate and recognize the teacher's accomplishments. In planning for the 22-23 colloquium, our program will continue with the same format as last year with year-end activities, including opportunities for candidates to review their ILP goals with their coach, individually reflect on the year-end overview, meet in small group 